Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, October 3rd, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for October 3rd, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in-person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Mayor Kavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Our first presentation tonight is the Government Finance Officers Association 2022 Hero Award Recognition. And I know that we have Katie Lugwood with GFOA uh, virtually attending. So Katie, I will turn it over to you for the presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, my name is Katie Ludwig. I um, am a senior manager with the um, Government Finance Officers Association. And I have my colleague, Mark Mack, um, uh, also with GFOA joining uh, tonight as well. Um, and Mark and I are so happy to be with you virtually tonight to present this award to Jenny Larson. Um, we got to work with Jenny um, back in 2020, 20, um, uh, prior to the pandemic, we were um, uh, doing a lot of work there in Dubuque and um, you know, really enjoyed working with Jenny and her staff. And again, so I'm really excited to present our 2022 GFOA Hero Award to Jenny Larson. Um, and I just kind of want to share a little bit of the, the kind of some of the reasons that we um, chose Jenny um, to, to uh, receive this award. So um, again, many of you probably know all of this, but I just kind of want to share some of these highlights with you. So uh, when COVID-19 hit, Jenny created four budget review teams, one to review staffing levels, one to review operating expenses, one to review capital expenditures, and one to review contracts and purchase services. Thanks to her leadership and skills, the City of Dubuque was able to avoid cutting any positions or critical services or programs to residents during the pandemic. Jenny also made efforts to create and offer assistance programs to utility customers unable to pay their bills, managed a moratorium on utility shutoffs for delinquent accounts, and developed new options for residents to pay bills remotely. Jenny has taken the initiative to participate in the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, identifying equity processes in place in cities across the nation and adapting promising practices to the city of Dubuque. She also has worked to design a session for your Citizen Academy that included a hands-on opportunity for residents to think about and discuss the trade-offs inherent in the budget process. Jenny implemented the Taxpayer Receipt Program that allows residents to generate an estimate of where their tax dollars are spent, 
and the Balancing Act Budget Simulator, both of which are available to residents through the city's website. She also was instrumental in implementing open expense and open budget online programs that allow, that allow anyone to see exactly where money is being spent. Jenny has led several initiatives to improve efficiency from implementing an online system for budget submissions to creating ranking criteria for capital improvement packages to developing an annual budget training regimen. And finally, she's led reform of the city's performance measures, developing guidance handbooks, training, and working with departments one-on-one -on -one to develop meaningful measures that are linked not only to the budget, but to the larger mission and vision of the organization. So again, it's for all of these reasons um, that we are so happy um, to um, be presenting this award to Jenny um, as one of our 2022 GFOA heroes. So thank you so much. Wish we could be there in person. <laughs> Well, Katie, th this is Mayor Kavanaugh. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate that presentation. And uh, Jenny, we, we see you sitting there. Is there anything you'd like to, to jump up and say here while you have a moment? Good evening. Uh, Jenny Larson, Director of Finance and Budget. Um, I was really humbled to receive this award. Obviously, it was a huge team effort throughout the pandemic and honestly, through every budget season, um, every department is involved. but. I really appreciate the award. I appreciate um, Katie Ludwig uh, taking the time tonight to present it. Um, also, would like to shout out to my husband, Sean, and my daughters, Caitlin and Callie. Um, they're always very supportive of my career here in public service. So I'm um, just really honored to receive the award. So thank you. Well, and on behalf of the City Council and everybody, Jenny, I, I mean, we say this every budget season, but not everybody's here to listen to us all the time when we're, you know, having the budget discussions. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of people doing a lot of work in the city of Dubuque. Uh, there are a few departments, though, that touch every single department in the way that yours does. And um, the work that you did during the pandemic was absolutely remarkable. And, and we, know, we noticed it. We took notice. And I'm glad that we have a moment here to be able to sit and enjoy that with you and enjoy this award because you truly do deserve it and it's really important that we take these moments to be able to recognize the work that's being done. So thank you again for all you're doing and thank you for being here. And thank you, Katie, as well. All right. Okay, Adrian. Our next presentation is the COVID-19 update. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. It's Mary Rose Corrigan, Public Health Director with your co uh, October 2022 COVID-19 update. So to start us off, we are seeing a consistent decline in the number of cases, and you can see the overall epi curve since March 2020 with our two very high peaks and now um, a downward trend line that is uh, lasting um, for qu many weeks. So since the end of August, we've had this downward decline and uh, it was up at 122 cases in uh, the end of August per seven days and now it's down to 37. And today when I checked, um, there was 39 cases in the last seven days. So that number is holding, we'll see if it does. Hospitalizations do bounce around a little bit um, but they took a big dip last week, and there was only two inpatient hospitalizations in Dubuque on uh, last Wednesday, so that's great news. The other change is our CDC community level is now low. Uh, not sure if we've ever had low be since they started the community level, but just to give you a comparison, um, as of last Thursday, when they give out this weekly level, there was 38 cases per 100,000 population. And at the June or the September 6th update I gave you, there was 125 per 100,000 population. Um, this week, there is seven admissions per 100,000 population to the hospital. And at the first part of September, there was 15. And our staffed inpatient beds by COVID patients was three percent this last week and at the beginning of September it was four percent 
So all of those numbers um, are going down. Now this low community level um, still means we need to practice all the recommendations that have been um, learned over the pandemic, and including, including first and foremost staying up to date with vaccinations boost and booster doses as the number one frontline strategy, and then um, making sure as we go into the fall and winter months our ventilation is adequate in our indoor buildings and keeping testing available and our isolation and quarantine um, guidance available and uh, so that everybody's aware of that. The transmission level, uh, which is what healthcare facilities are using, we had another uh, pretty big change in the first part of September that was still at high. Uh, in the middle of September, it went to substantial and right now it's moderate. Um, so looking back in the records, I don't, I think the last time we were not high transmission was early May of 2021. So let's hope this number holds. A little bit on uh, vaccinations. Um, you, can, you can break this down on a lot of different age groups and who's up to date with what. Um, basically, 65.7% of the total um, population in Dubuque County is fully vaccinated. Um, those greater than five years with one booster is about 58%. Um, with two bo boosters, those greater than 65 is 53%. And over 49, it's 43%. So you can kind of see with the number of boosters, um, the percentage goes down a little bit. And every time we introduce a new vaccine or booster, we see a slight uptick in people getting the vaccine and then it um, drops dramatically and levels off. So um, these are all still available in the community. Um, we've rolled out the bivalent vaccines, the ones that are affected against Omicron, um, particularly B4 and B5 subvariants that have come out. Uh, ministered two months after your primary series. Those are out there, um, no limitations on um, supply right now. Most places would like an appointment, um, but some places are taking walk-in. And coming soon, um, the FDA is set to hear on the bivalent boosters for children, five to 11 years old. First Pfizer and then Moderna. I think they have their hearing this week and then it still has to go through um, CDC approval. So we never know quite sure what day, but we have pre-ordered that vaccine. So when it's approved, our local providers will be able to start um, distributing that. Um, like I said, no supply issues. Uh, and as a reminder, there's no priority groups for these vaccines. In the past, we've had, you know, elderly only being eligible or immunocompromised. There's no, um, it's available to everyone. Uh, I mentioned appointments, but the VNA does have uh, ongoing walk-in clinics on um, some Mondays and Fridays. Um, you can always schedule an appointment on those days also, but um, they do have those available. Now that's all good news, and um, we know we're coming upon flu se influenza season, flu season, and so um, as always, I encourage everyone to get vaccinated for the flu. You can get it at the same time you get your COVID vaccine. Um, no harm there. Um, but a, a lot of people are asking me, this is pretty much gonna be like the flu every year, right? We're gonna get another shot. Um, that's what it's gonna turn out to be. Well, maybe someday, but we're not there yet. And I'd like to explain just a couple differences. So influenza is seasonal. We know it hits winter, late winter, early spring. And COVID is not seasonal. We've had spikes in July, in November, in April. There's no seasonality and that's worldwide. Influenza um, is somewhat predictable. We know what flu mutations are coming based on what's happening around the world and how we can predict that. The COVID um, virus is muta mutating four times faster than the influenza virus. And the only thing predictable 
about COVID-19 is that it is unpredictable. Um, and that puts us um, where we're able to have vaccine ready for influenza based on <coughs> predictions and modeling. Whereas with COVID-19, the vaccines usually come out after the subvariants are identified because we don't know which ones are going to be harmful and which ones are coming. And <coughs> influenza in peak season in the U.S. has about 800 to 1,700 flu deaths each day during peak season, which may be several weeks or maybe a month. Um, COVID-19 right now, the seven-day moving average for deaths per day is 316. It was around 400 per day um, last week, but that's an average. So, and finally, we know influenza has been around for decades and most recently since the early 20th century. And this COVID-19 we know is a brand new novel virus. So this depicts just um, the COVID deaths as it relates to common flu deaths. And uh, you can see it, we're on the decline on deaths and including in Dubuque, we've had, um, our death rate has greatly decreased over the summer, but nonetheless, it's still a lot more than influenza. So keep that in mind. Um, we need to follow the same kind of precautions for each one, um, respiratory, um, cough and sneeze and cold hygiene, staying home when you're sick and, those, and getting vaccinated. So um, let's be ready for that this fall and <coughs> winter. Um, I won't be here with you in person in November. I'll send a written report, um, but I'll be back in December with the live update. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you have now. I have a question. Did you just get to give us some good news? I, I think so, but I, you know. It seemed that way, <laughs> and it's been a while since yes, you've had that has, opportunity. That's kind of two pieces of good news with the community rate and the transmission rate and the continuing downward decline, so. Yeah, it's great, thank you. All right, I don't think we have any other questions. Thank you very much, Mary Rose, we appreciate well. it. All right, Adrian. We will move on to proclamations. Our first proclamation is <clears throat> Energy Efficiency Day. All right, we've got the fun stuff tonight. I think that's probably why we have more of a full house, which is nice. We've got other fun stuff later if you want to stick around, but I, we're going to be doing some reading here, and I think that there's a lot of fun proclamations to share. So energy efficiency, I believe we have Michaela Freiberger here to join us. Hi, Michaela. Hello. Michaela Freiberger, Program Coordinator for the Dubuque County Energy District. First of all, thank you for this opportunity to be here again in front of you talking about energy and the importance of clean energy in our community. So with the loss of our state investment in our energy efficiency programs, um, especially to those who are most vulnerable in our community, we at the Clean Energy District are very thankful for your commitment to the 50% by 2030 Climate Action Plan. So energy efficiency is a key component um, when we go out and meet with individuals in our community, it's a great way to break down barriers and it's a great way to talk about, number one, green as economic benefits, but also green as our environmental benefits. And so things like light bulbs are really beneficial to break down that barrier conversation to individuals who might be a little afraid to invite our Green Iowa AmeriCorps team into their homes to do a full energy audit. And so we find that energy efficiency especially is the best way in our clean energy district world to not only reach our most vulnerable um, populations, but also it really truly bridges that green meets green communication. And it also builds our goals towards energy justice. So today we are very thankful to be here again accepting this proclamation and celebrating energy in our community. Well, thank you, Michaela. And thank you very much for joining us this evening to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas energy efficiency continues to be the most cost-effective, quickest, and cleanest way to meet our energy needs and reduce utility bills for residential, business, and industrial customers while making homes and work healthier, safer, and more comfortable. And whereas smarter energy use reduces the amount of electricity needed to power our lives, which helps avoid power plant emissions and can harm, that can harm our health, pollute our air, and warm our climate. 
And whereas implementing energy efficiency and other clean energy policies help boost economic opportunities and job creation while continuing to move toward a sustainable future. And whereas improved energy codes for homes and commercial buildings also can significantly reduce utility costs and create new jobs. And Dubuque, Iowa supports increasing the minimum levels of efficiency for new buildings through adoption of stricter code or the Model 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. And whereas the 50% by 2030 Community Climate Action and Resiliency Plan promotes equitable access to clean energy and helps to meet the emissions reduction goal. And whereas the first Wednesday in October is National Annual Energy Efficiency Day. And together, the residents of Dubuque, Iowa can continue to contribute to our sustainability efforts by learning more about energy efficiency, the Dubuque County Energy District, and practicing smarter energy use in their daily lives. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the fifth day of October 2022 as Energy Efficiency Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and urge residents to join us in supporting our clean energy goals and moving toward more energy efficiency now and in the future. Feel free to clap after everyone. I'll just give you that permission now. <laughs> Our next proclamation is White Cane Safety Day. All right, and I believe we have Lou Oswald here to accept this proclamation this evening. Blessed evening, Mayor and City Council. Unfortunately, Lou could not make it. I am Brianna Hansen. This is Nick Brown. We are Assistant Secretaries of the Tri-State Blind at 1068 Cedar Cross Road. Um, on behalf of the Tri-State Blind Society, we really just want to thank all of you for recognizing that visually impaired persons, um, that they are important and the importance of their white cane safety day. As we all know, losing your sight can be extremely disorientating because you have to find your way around everything all over again. And there are certain ways to gain that independence, white cane being one of them. So we definitely want to invite everybody to the Tri-State Blind October 15th from 11 to 1, where we will be celebrating White Cane Safety Day. And again, we just greatly appreciate for everything you guys do for our community. Well, Brianna, Nick, thank you very much for being here this evening to accept this proclamation. We appreciate yes. that. Thank you. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the white cane is an important sign of independence, symbolizing the ability of visually impaired persons to travel in our cities and towns with great confidence and safety. And whereas the white cane symbolizes caution, reminding us to be courteous and considerate while ensuring the safety of visually impaired persons. And whereas October 15th marks White Cane Safety Day, which observes visually impaired persons with activities that contribute to maximum independent use of our streets and public facilities by our visually impaired persons. And whereas Iowa law requires that drivers who approach a person wholly or partially blind, carrying a cane or walking stick, white in color or white tipped with red, or being led by a guide dog wearing a harness, shall immediately come to a complete stop and take such precautions as may be necessary to avoid accident or injury. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 15th of October, 2022, as White Cane Safety Day in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. Our third proclamation is trick-or-treat night. All right, now I get to accept this one on behalf of the city council and the <laughs> residents of Dubuque. Everybody get your costumes ready. City of Dubuque proclamation. Whereas corn stalks, pumpkins, and, golden, and a golden moon will herald the cool weather of autumn and the entertaining holiday of Halloween, 
And whereas Halloween is a f the fun time of year when young and old become creative and emerge as ghosts, devils, witches, cartoon characters, superheroes, and more. And whereas all manner of delightful costumed individuals go from house to house on their annual journey for candy and treats, announcing their arrival with a hearty trick or treat. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim Monday, October 31st, 2022, as Trick or Treat Night, during the hours of 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. in the City of Dubuque, Iowa, and urge all motorists to be watchful for our youngsters making their annual rounds. Nobody's gonna clap for me on that one? <laughs> Thank you. Looking forward to trick or treat night. Our fourth proclamation is Dubuque Rescue Mission 90th anniversary. All right, I believe Mr. Rick Mim is here with us this evening. Good evening, city council members and the mayor. Rick Mim, director of the Dubuque Rescue Mission and our board president, Morgan Fraser. Um, Thank you. It's great to follow Trick or Treat proclamation. I'm happy to do that. For those of you that don't know, the, maybe everyone in here knows this, the Dubuque Rescue Mission is a block away on Main Street, 4th and Main, have been there for, well, within that block, 4th or 5th in Iowa for 90 years. And um, uh, Brad's going to share a few of the things we do, but um, probably... Uh, the biggest ministry we have is feeding people that are hungry. And uh, we do about 200 people a day, breakfast, lunch, and supper at the Rescue Mission 365 days a, a year. So um, it's, it's a little bit odd um, as, a, as a man of faith to stand up here and to get a proclamation saying, wow, really good job feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and housing the housing the poor. It's not sort of the thing Jesus is going to, you know, go and proclaim that. Uh, but anyhow, I appreciate uh, the proclamation for our 90th anniversary. So did you want to say? And I would just like to say, growing up in a small town across the river in Benton, Wisconsin, and moving to Dubuque, I thought I was moving to a big city where I wouldn't know anyone. And when I got to Dubuque, I realized that Dubuque is a small town in disguise, and you all work to help one another. And for 90 years, the Dubuque Rescue Mission has done just that. What started out as a reading room to a soup kitchen to where we are now. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but we just recently purchased a new building, the old Dubuque Food Pantry. So we'll have a second warming shelter for men in the winter and I believe showers and everything. So we'll, we'll be set there. So thank you to everyone on the council and to the city of Dubuque for your support over the last 90 years. Well, Rick and Morgan, thank you so much for being here to accept this. And Rick, while I see your point, I also think it's very important that we do hold up the things that you're doing because the community needs to know about the services that you provide and all the things that are happening. And um, it's very important. And the work that you continue to do and the growth that you continue to see. So thank you for doing all of it every day. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas on Valentine's Day of 1932, the Reverend William Masters, pastor of First Baptist Church and Edward Beach of First Congregational Church, and the caring people of Dubuque began serving soup to the men of the Great Depression. And whereas in the first week of opening its doors, the Dubuque Rescue Mission served 310 meals and provided shelter for 60 men. And whereas since that time, the mission has continued to serve those most in need with daily meals, providing shelter to 52 homeless men, most in a dormitory setting, others in transitional homes or apartments. And whereas the mission operates two thrift stores, providing clothing, furniture, and houseware items, free to those most in need, or for a moderate price, which has provided supplement income in difficult times. And whereas, through recent donations from generous benefactors, the mission was able to purchase property on White Street for a warming drop-in center for clients seeking refuge from the cold a place to rest, a shower, a restroom, or a friendly smile. And whereas the Dubuque Rescue Mission is made possible through the faith-filled support of volunteers, benefactors, and the entire community of Dubuque and the surrounding area. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby gratefully acknowledge and celebrate the Dubuque Rescue Mission's 90 years of service to the poor and marginalized in the City of Dubuque, Iowa.
Thanks, Jeff. Our fifth proclamation is Dubuque Eagles Eyes on the Future Fundraising Milestone. All right, we welcome Michael Deere up to say a few words. Thank you, Brad, council members, my good friend Mike over here. And uh, anyway, uh, back in January 2008, uh, I just said, I want to go on a journey and I want to take young people with me. Been doing a lot of things with the Eagles through the years and moving through chairs here and there. And uh, uh, so back in January 2008, I met with the Loris College uh, president of the student body, Matt Maloney, who's actually going to come back. I haven't seen him since 2009. He's going to come back next, a week from this Saturday, the 15th. We're going to have a gathering in Loris College uh, Student Life Office, and Brad's going to be there and present us with a proclamation. We have the presidents of the three colleges going to be there, and uh, President Jim Wagner of the Veterans Freedom Center, and uh, uh, Mike's going to, Mike's going to, and Nancy's invited also. But anyway, um, I just lay, sat down at the table and I laid out a vision what uh, what we wanted to do. And here we are, this fall, we're going to hit a quarter million dollars we've given to the homeless. Homeless animals, education, <coughs> youth groups, to our veterans. Homeless animals, like I said, homeless animals all over the world. And St. Jude's. Uh, so we reached out and we've touched a lot of people in this community. And uh, so we're finally hitting this milestone. and. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure and an honor with you, uh, Brad. First met you volunteering down to uh, the food pantry. But uh, we're looking forward to a week from this Saturday. And like I say, the student I started was going to be there. He's going to come back from Chicago with his wife. And a second student uh, from Clark University, she's going to be there. But uh, we cl help clean up for the veterans Saturday. And so uh, uh, we're, we're going to do a lot, of, a lot of things ahead. So uh, thank you for inviting us here. And, God bless you. Thanks, Adrian, also. Well, thank you. Whoops, sorry. Whose trap that was? Yeah. We don't usually leave water there as a trap. Sorry about that, Michael. Yeah. It was full. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to October 15th. All you council members are inv uh, invited also to the Student Life Office of Loris College Campus at 1030 on Saturday, uh, October 15th, the week of the Saturday. All right. Look forward to seeing Brad. He's going to have an extended version of the proclamation to, uh, on Saturday. The That's right. Everybody knows how much I love reading proclamations, right? Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas in January 2008, founder and chairman Michael Deere met with Loris College student Matt Maloney, then president of the Loris student body, to lay out a vision for college and high school students who have a passion for service to join a journey to empower people, make a profound investment in people, to be a resourceful partner with citizenship, and to follow their passion to heed a call to service and help those less fortunate. And whereas the Dubuque Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee, members include students from Loris College, Clark University, University of Dubuque, Wallert Catholic High School, Senior High School, and Hempstead High School. And whereas Michael Deere is founder and chairman of the Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee, now in its 14th year. The Eyes on the Future Committee will hit a milestone of raising a quarter of a million dollars in its first 14 years of existence this fall of 2022. And whereas since January of 2008, the Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee has raised funds for many local initiatives and organizations, including college scholarships, local college education funds, homeless shelters, health centers, children's programming, food pantries, veterans services, and many more. Now, therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby officially recognize the extraordinary and continued efforts of the Dubuque Eagles Eyes on the Future Committee for their volunteer work and engaged volunteers in raising a quarter of a million dollars in their first 14 years of existence. Thank you, Corey and Todd, for helping with that. All right, Adrian, I think we have one more. Yes, our final proclamation is Arts and Humanities Month. So we have Jenny Peterson Brandt and Nick Halder here with us this evening. Thanks, team. 
Good evening. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm Jenny Peterson Brandt, Arts and Cultural Affairs Coordinator with the City of Dubuque, and with me is... I'm Nick Calder. I'm the Executive and Artistic Director of the Grand Opera House, as well as the Chair of the Arts and Cultural Affairs Commission. And it's our honor tonight to accept tonight's proclamation on behalf of the Arts and Cultural Affairs <laughs> Advisory Commission. We would like to take a moment to recognize and thank the arts, culture, and humanities workers and volunteers of the community. We have a number of them with us tonight. We just want those folks who are able to either stand or raise their hand, who are part of that sector, to, to do that right now so you can receive a, a round of applause along with everyone else. It is part of our great pleasure in working for the city of Dubuque to work in partnership with these, um, these folks and with a robust network of diverse residents who dedicate their time and expertise to cultivate a dynamic creative sector that makes Dubuque a vibrant and desirable place to live, work, and play. Thank you for acknowledging tonight and continuing to prioritize, invest in, and in how accessible arts and humanities experiences contribute to our collective work for a more prosperous and equitable community. Through creative expression and access to programs that explore our shared humanity, the unheard stories are told, cultural histories, histories are shared, and space is made for dialogue and the exchange of ideas. This in turn nurtures empathy, understanding, and community. In addition to tonight's proclamation, we hope you and the residents of Dubuque will engage with the City of Dubuque's Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs on Facebook and Instagram throughout the month for daily features of local arts and humanities programs and projects to coincide with Americans for the Arts Show Your Art 2022 social media challenge. So thank you to the Mayor and City Council and the community of Dubuque for acknowledging and supporting the important role that the arts and humanities play in the social vibrancy and economic robustness of our community. Well, thank you both, Jenny and Nick, for being here, and everyone who was able to join you as well to accept this proclamation for all the great work that you continue to do. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas the nation's 120,000 nonprofit arts organizations, the National Endowment, for the arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the nation's 4,500 local arts agencies, and the Arts and Humanities Councils of the 50 states and the six US ju jurisdictions and districts have regularly issued official proclamations on an annual basis designating October as National Arts and Humanities Month. And whereas, despite significant losses due to the coronavirus pandemic, the creative industries remain among the most vital sectors of the economy, providing innovative opportunities for community development, creating jobs and economic activity within their own and across sectors, and making communities attractive for tourism attraction, business development, and workforce retention. And whereas Dubuque's nonprofit arts and culture sector generates $47.2 million in economic activity annually, supporting 1,530 jobs, and generating $5 million in local and state government revenue. And whereas our community prioritizes investment in grant support, public art programming, and ongoing implementation of Dubuque's Arts and Culture Master Plan. And whereas the arts and humanities embody so much of the accumulated wisdom, intellect, and imagination of humankind. And whereas the arts and humanities play a unique role in creating connection and telling the stories of and amongst our families, communities, and country. And whereas local arts and humanities programs are dedicated to inclusive access, diverse representation, and equitable empowerment of creatives, culture bearers, and humanities scholars towards a more connected, just, and inclusive Dubuque. Now therefore, I, Brad M. Cavanaugh, Mayor of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2022 as Arts and Humanities Month in the City of Dubuque, Iowa. All right, thank you everyone. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. 
for all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through four of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Is there anyone in the chambers who would like any of the consent items removed for separate discussion this evening? If anyone virtually. There are no virtual comments. Okay. And no written input received. All right, I'll bring it back to the table then. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Ms. Farber. I'd like to um, remove item number six for, from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended, except for number six. I'll second. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Roussel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. That motion passes 7 0. Um, then back to Ms. Farber. Right, yes. I always forget this part. So back to Ms. Farber. Thank you. Thank you. So for item number six, I actually own property on the plat that is being discussed. And so I'd like to recuse myself from this vote. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Any other discussion? Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal uh, with uh, number six as recommended. Second. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes 6 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have three. First is disposal of city interest in previously vacated street and alley right-of-way areas in the city of Dubuque, Iowa for October 17th, 2022. Second is set public hearing for sale of city-owned property at 2414 Windsor Avenue for October 17th, 2022. And third is fiscal year 2023 first budget amendment for October 17th, 2022. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates and times uh, specified. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. May I find out whether or not I should recuse myself? Uh, would now be the time to do that, or would it be during it, the public hearing? It's just setting it for setting public it, okay. hearing, so Aye. There, no conflict there. Okay. So we, we have an aye from Farber? Yes. Thank you. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to boards and commissions. We have mayoral selection of appointment to the Civil Service Commission and City Council appointments to the Community Development Advisory Commission and the Housing Commission. Thank you, Adrian. So for the Civil Service Commission, we have one four-year term through April 6, 2026, and we do have two applicants. Um, I would like to appoint Scott Crabill to this, uh, to the Civil Service Commission, and I would just ask for the council's agreement to the, oh, I'm sorry. So at this point, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, but because of the way Chapter 400 of the Iowa Code works, you indicate your intent to appoint him, and then we have to publish it in the paper for 30 days, so you actually cannot make the appointment, or uh, ask for concurrence until the November 7th city council meeting. You know, that's all written right there, isn't it? Thank you very much, Krenna, for, <laughs> for reminding me of what is written right on the page. I really appreciate that, thank you. Yes, so then I would like to state uh, my intention to appoint Scott Crabill to the Civil Service Commission, and um, that is all I need to do at this time, correct? Yes, okay. so then Adrian will publish it accordingly. Uh, and this one is weird. You're, thank you, thank yeah. you, I appreciate it, yep. And I'll be sure to, you know, normally I read pretty carefully, but I'll be sure. Thank you very much for helping. Okay, then we will move on then to the Community Development Advisory Commission. Um, on this commission, we have one three-year term through February 15th, 2024, and one applicant, so I will entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones. I move that Jerry Hamill be appointed to the remainder of the three-year term through February 15th, 2024. Second, Sprank. All right, got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. 
Motion passes 7-0. Jerry Hamill is appointed to the Community Development Advisory Commission. And then the final appointment we have to make this evening is on the Housing Commission. We have one three-year term through August 17th, 2025, and one applicant. So I will entertain a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to appoint Kathy Dickens to the Housing Commission. Second by Farber. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes. Kathy Dickens is appointed to the Housing Commission. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is 2022 John F. Kennedy Road Sidewalk Installation Project. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second. A motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. <coughs> city Engineer Gus Zahoyas <coughs> is recommending City Council adoption of the resolution approving the plans, specifications, form of contract, <coughs> an estimated cost of $351,089.82 for the 2022 John F. Kennedy Road sidewalk installation project. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are on a public hearing to consider city council adoption of the resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract, and estimated costs for the John F. Kennedy Road sidewalk installation project. Do we have anyone in chambers this evening to address the council on this item? We have anyone virtually? We do not. Okay. And no input received. Okay, I'll bring it back to the table. Seeing no discussion or questions, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. The motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number two is Park and Recreation Advisory Commission <clears throat> member removal recommendation. Mr. Ms. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Roussel. <laughs> I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Got a motion by Roussel, a second by Jones. Crenna, am I coming to you for this for any memo? Uh, we sure can. It's a letter from the commission, and it relates to um, a request by the commission to remove a commissioner from the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission and then uh, direct the city clerk's office to advertise to fill the position. During the last 12 months, um, the gentleman whose last name I cannot pronounce, yes. Hutchberger perhaps, um, has been absent from eight regular commission meetings, most recently five consecutive meetings. So the chair of the commission um, drafted the letter and indicates that by unanimous vote of the commission at the August 9th meeting, they respectfully request that the individual be removed from the commission and that someone be appointed to fill it in the future. And they indicate regret that the request does not come lightly, but honoring the attendance policy that is required for appointees of your boards and commissions. And they feel they have no choice but to ask for such. Thank you, Krenna. We are in a public hearing to consider the removal of Park and Recreation Advisory Commission Commissioner Justin Hochberger per pursuant to City of Dubuque Code of Ordinances, Title 10, Chapter 4, Section 10, 5A2, and the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone in the chambers to address us on this item? Anyone virtually? We do not. And no input received. All right, I'll bring it back to the table then for any questions or discussion. Seeing none, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number three <coughs> is approving a sixth amendment to a development agreement between the city of Dubuque, Iowa, and the Hotel Dubuque LLC. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. I'd like to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. And a motion by Farber and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. 
City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Economic Development Director Jill Connors is recommending City Council adopt a resolution approving a Sixth Amendment to the development agreement between the City of Dubuque and the Hotel Dubuque LLC. On June 17, 2013, the City entered into a development agreement with Warehouse Trust LLC assigned to Novelty Iron Landlord LLC for the renovation of the Novelty Iron Works building. The Hotel Dubuque LLC has entered into a purchase agreement with Novelty Iron Landlord LLC to purchase the condominium units and parking lot presently owned by Novelty Iron Landlord LLC. The Ho Hotel Dubuque LLC is proposing to construct at least 80 hotel rooms with supporting spaces branded as a full service boutique hotel with a capital investment of approximately $25 million. The Novelty Iron Landlord LLC condominium units and parking lot comprised three condominium units. The condominium regime, regime has been amended to two units. Unit A will be the apartment units and Unit B will be the hotel and the parking lot. The proposed Sixth Amendment makes the following necessary modifications to the development agreement. It reflects the assignment of the development agreement to the Hotel Dubuque LLC, establishes the substance and cost of the new minimum improvements to be carried out on the new taxable parcel, modifies the semi-annual economic development grants to reflect two taxable parcels. Unit A, the residential portion of the building, will receive nine years of tax increment rebates. This fulfills the remainder of the originally committed 15 years of tax increment financing rebates, which payments were committed in 2012 upon execution of the development agreement and began in November 2016. Unit B, the hotel, will receive 10 years of tax increment financing rebates. The existing nine years plus one additional year, consistent with the city's practice of providing 10 years of tax increment financing for a major rehabilitation. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Mike. We are in a public hearing to consider city council adopt a resolution approving a sixth amendment to develop an agreement between the city of Dubuque, Iowa and the Hotel Dubuque LLC. Do we have anyone in chambers to address us on this item? Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Susan Hess from Hammer Law Firm, here to address you in support of this memorandum um, on behalf of Novelty Ironworks. And I just wanted to um, thank you for your consideration. And I wanted to start tonight with a quote from Gary Dolphin, who is champion of some of the development in the Novelty Building. Gary Dolphin Iron Bar um, says, Quote, when I decided to create a namesake establishment in Dubuque, there was really just one choice, Novelty Ironworks. I'm a history buff, and I had watched as the development team carefully restored and revitalized the enormous 260,000 square foot complex. It has truly become the social epicenter in Dubuque, offering our citizens an amazing place to live, work, and play. And in support of that, um, the leadership at Hotel Dubuque LLC and their extended team of industry-leading advisors have leveraged their collective knowledge of real estate markets, community development, planning, public-private partnership tools and finance in order to structure and assemble this truly innovative project. As an example, this past summer in June, the ABI um, conference was hosted in Dubuque. This brought over 500 people to the downtown area. Uh, the Novelty Iron Works was able to have the reception dinner there, but we didn't have enough hotel space uh, during this time. You couldn't find a hotel room in downtown Dubuque in June. So we truly need 
this project and this development agreement in order to allow additional um, housing and renovation of this building into the hotel. As, um, as stated, there are two units now, Unit A and Unit B. Uh, unit A will be the commercial space, and Unit B will be the hotel space. I want to introduce you to um, David Elias Ratchi, uh, who's going to talk a little bit more about the hotel portion of the project and maybe answer any questions that you might have. Council members, uh, Your Honor, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you and I want to thank staff. They've been great to work with. Uh, it's always a pleasure when, when you work with pro uh, professionals and, and certainly that's the staff that's here. We're very excited about this project. Uh, we're doing this with Hyatt. It will be a branded, um, what's called, it used to be called Schwa de Vive, it's just called JDV now, but it will be a boutique hotel. It will be full service. Um, it will have a restaurant on the roof and other amenities that will be going in. And we're very excited. This is a great market to be in, uh, and we look forward to getting uh, started uh, here in the next month or two. So is there any questions? If you don't mind, we'll hold for questions until we're done oh, with the public sure, input portion no of this, and then we'll, we'll bring it back. So okay. if you could hold, we'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you both for your comments. Um, do we have any other comments on this item? Uh, virtual? No virtual comments. Okay. And no input received. All right, thank you. So now bring it back to the table, and if we have any questions or discussion. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Sprank. Yeah, um, I guess my question is, is this is actually the hotel, you're not actually going to be relocating any tenants or downsizing, you're actually just going to be <coughs> building it out of empty space. So um, all the units, uh, so if, if you knew, if you looked at the, the, the building now, the apartments are on the upper levels and the hotel is going on uh, the lower levels. So it's all vacant space right now that we're going into. Thank you. It's actually done a little bit Backwards, usually the hotel goes in first. This is the first time I've ever come in after everything's done. So uh, it's great for us because there's already, people know where it is. The, in, you know, the, the warehouse district is really a phenomenal place. And I, I will mention this, you mentioned the Congress. Uh, we do work up in Mason City as well. Uh, and they are, were at that conference and uh, they're saying, now we hope you do everything up here that you did down in Dubuque. So um, we are looking forward to it. And um, there was a lot of talk about this community, in, you know, Iowa wide, and how much you've put into the warehouse district and other aspects of your community. Mr. Mayor, yeah. I, I just wanted to reiterate what uh, Mr. Van Milligan said there near the end, that, the, that our TIF, um, uh, is all only because of um, this major rehabilitation that you're going to be doing, putting $25 million in, into that area of town, uh, and it's for a high quality investment. So I think it's going to be really good, good use of TIF, and um, welcome, and thank you for investing in Dubuque, Iowa. Our pleasure. All right, well, seeing no other comments or questions, thank you very much thank for you. making yourself available for those and for your comments. Um, yeah, personally, I think this is, uh, I'm looking forward to voting for this. I think this is going to be a good addition to an already bustling Millwork district. So we're pretty excited to see that. All right, so we have a motion by uh, Ms. Farber and a second by Mr. Sprank to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the Mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then City staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes, and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. 
Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public input this evening on any of the action items on the agenda or anything under our control? Seeing none here in chambers, do we have any virtual input? We do not. Okay. I'll just state for the record that regarding action item number one, correspondence was received from the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, the Dubuque Racing Association, and Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, and all of those letters have been uploaded to the agenda item. All right. Thank you very much, Adrian. All right. So seeing no public input this evening, we can move on to the action items, please. Action item number one is support for minimum revenue guarantee to attract an ultra low cost carrier to Dubuque Regional Airport. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, approve and view the presentation. Second. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Jones. Uh, Mike, did you have a memo you wanna read? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. The Dubuque Regional Airport Commission and airport staff continue to work with travel partners especially the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce Air Service Task Force, to provide options to improve commercial air ser service with a three-pronged strategy. Number one is restore daily commercial air service to major hubs with connecting flights. Number two is begin weekly commercial air service to leisure destinations. And number three is to support the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce Coalition to restore, sustain, and enhance air service. In, further, in furtherance of strategy number two, Airport Director Todd Dalsing is recommending that the City of Dubuque budget $250,000 a year for two years for a total of $500,000 towards a minimum revenue guarantee to get an ultra low cost carrier to provide four flights a week, two to Orlando, Florida, and two to Fort Myers, Florida on a 737-800, which is an 180 seat aircraft. This request has been approved by the Dubuque Regional Airport Commission and is supported by the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce Air Service Task Force. Letters of support have been submitted by the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation and the Dubuque Racing Association. The actual minimum revenue guarantee is $500,000 a year for two years for a total of $1 million. A request is being considered by the Dubuque County Board of Supervisors for the remaining funding. The source of the City of Dubuque funding would be $150,000 from the Urban Development Action Grant Business Loan Repayments and $350,000 from the allocation of American Rescue Plan Act funding the City of Dubuque had received from the federal government. This was $350,000 that had been allocated for fiber optic projects, leaving $2,650,000 for that purpose. In 2019, the Dubuque area generated 20,355 visits to Orlando, Florida. And in 2021, the Dubuque area generated 11,601 visits to Fort Myers, Florida. Airport Director Todd Dalsing will have a presentation to City Council on this item. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. <clears throat> Go ahead, Todd, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Todd Dalsing, Dubuque Regional Airport. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for all for the opportunity to provide an update on uh, commercial air service and uh, our pending request. Uh, to start, I'd like to introduce uh, Molly Grover with the Chamber of Commerce to provide an update on behalf of the Chamber-led Air Service Task Force. Molly. I think it's far. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you this evening. Uh, we're really excited about this opportunity uh, that we have right now. And just to reiterate what City Manager Mike Van Mulligan has already mentioned, the Air Service Task Force is comprised of 20 leaders from the public and private sector, and they work together to make sure that we are enhancing the services and the offerings at the Dubuque Regional Airport. The Air Service Task, the Air Service Task Force members, they're here to educate and advocate and engage the community on air service issues. Uh, they assist with the Dubuque Regional Airport in the recruitment and the retention of air service. 
So here are some of the members, all of the members of the Air Service Task Force. It continues to grow, but many of the leaders that you know and recognize that are very much engaged in our business community. In fact, Alex Dixon, the president and CEO of the Q Casino and DRA is in the audience this evening. Uh, Todd and myself are on it, uh, amongst other people from the community. So we needed to update, considering the departure of American Airlines, there was a need to update our goal and our strategies as we approach our air service issues. So we updated our goal recently uh, to uh, read as a as displayed is a partnership with our public and private sector to restore, sustain, and enhance commercial air service to the Dubuque Regional Airport. It used to be before the departure of American Airlines, we wanted to enhance. Uh, now, with the departure of American Airlines, the urgency to restore and make sure that we can sustain air service with having both short-term and long-term solutions. The Air Service Task Force, our objectives, again, which City Manager Mike Van Milligan stated, to restore daily commercial air service to major hubs with connecting flights. This is crucially important. Legacy carriers, alternate carriers, this is really a piece that helps uh, support our business community. Weekly commercial air service to leisure destinations, this is about being able to have diversity of options for our community, for both businesses and residents alike. Making sure that we have that diverse portfolio ensures the long-term sustainability of air service in our community. It also allows us the opportunity to capture market that we have not been able to capture before, the leisure market, which often leaves our community to get to those ultra-low cost carrier rates in other regions at other airports. Uh, and the third, the Chamber is building a coalition that's going to address restoring, sustaining, and enhancing air service for the long term by building a coalition of like communities that have either redu reduced or lost <coughs> service uh, like the Dubuque Regional Airport. Uh, so an update, we are going to, our strategy involves discussions with commercial carriers and legacy carriers, uh, alternate carriers, utilizing our small community air service development grant, which the city uh, so generously supported. We do have that SCASD grant until 2026. Uh, it's approximately $1.3 million. Really important as we continue talks with legacy carriers uh, to make sure that we have hubs and major carriers uh, to support our business community growth and economic prosperity. Two, discussions with ultra-low cost carriers, providing weekly service to leisure destinations. That is also an important amenity that our uh, community needs uh, to sustain both businesses and workforce alike. And then third, the Chamber Coalition, thanks to a grant uh, that we were generously awarded from the Dubuque Racing Association, uh, we are established in a coalition of like communities to restore commercial, commercial air service to our community. So thank you very much. So I wanted to give you an update on the status of air service right now, and I, and I do want to thank um, the mayor, uh, especially that it's been involved with our meetings, not only with um, our uh, federal legislators, state legislators, but even the air carriers in the pe previous couple of weeks. But we continue um, to work in person and virtually with um, you know all of our uh, uh, travel partners, consultants, uh, <coughs> coordinating meetings with legacy and regional air carriers, as Molly said, to restore daily service. Uh, most recent status of air service, uh, legacy carriers such as uh, American and Delta and United, um, you know, they've exited 59 airports since the start of the pandemic. So this is no easy task that we're taking on on that third level or third uh, uh, leg of that stool. Um, according to the Regional Airline Association, more than 300 airports have seen air service re reductions in the last three years. Regional markets, uh, Dubuque included, has, have suffered the most in recent years due to the increased operating costs, retirement of aircraft, pilot and aviation workforce shortage. And the airline capacity is down, but air travel demand is up, uh, especially leisure. Uh, which brings us to an opportunity and, and quite honestly something that the public has been asking for for, for many years, at, at least on the airport side of things. So, you know, we're currently under negotiations with an uh, ultra low cost carrier, or as we call a ULCC, uh, to enter into an air service agreement for uh, weekly commercial service. This agreement is performance based. Uh, so, you know, obviously the more full the aircraft, the better the performance. 
but it does have the potential for adding um, additional destinations. Uh, so to date, we've uh, negotiated, and, and I'll expand on these on the next slide, uh, two-year contract, airport fees waived, marketing funds, ground handling, and a minimum revenue guarantee of $1 million, which is, that's why we're here tonight. That's the final component of our negotiations. So if approved um, by both entities, the city and the county, then we can take that um, offer to the ULCC and continue on with our um, negotiations. And then also a, a point that I wanted to make that any unspent funds could potentially be returned to the entity, be it the city or the county, or um, possibly applied to new service. So not the service that we would potentially have to those two markets, but maybe a westbound service or, or eastbound or something like that. So. Um, so any, uh, any, entering any new market by any a legacy carrier um, or a ULCC, it's, it's, it's risky. And, and all airlines now are requiring some sort of risk management to help cover their costs, it says in the slide. Uh, rich, uh, risk management includes uh, airport fee waivers. Uh, those are such things as landing fees, office rents, things of those nature, which the airport commission approved, waiving those fees in their September 13th meeting. Uh, marketing funds uh, to date for uh, at least as of FY23, the airport has budgeted $25,000. Um, we've applied for and received a grant from the Iowa Department of Transportation Aviation for $25,000. Uh, and last week, the Chamber uh, Board of Commerce approved $25,000 for a total of $75,000 plus in-kind uh, marketing in our local area and our ULCC participation. Um, the airport commission has already approved in that same meeting that I mentioned earlier that the uh, use of ground support equipment, uh, ground handling, uh, really there's two options. So either the carrier can provide uh, their own employees to do the ground handling of their aircraft or you can contract with a second party. Um, to help keep costs low, uh, our current negotiations, we're working with our, our own uh, airport owned or city owned Dubuque Jet Center. Uh, that'll provide the ground handling, which that, that includes things like the marshalling of aircraft, loading, unloading of bags, fueling, checking in, things like that. Um, I also included a, the definition of a MRG just for clarification and, and what it is. It's an airline is guaranteed to generate a specified amount of revenue. If the airline does not meet the targeted uh, revenue, the local entity make payment to the airline for any uh, shortfall. So air service is not a coincidence. Um, after reviewing our top 10 markets, we put together a presentation, and when I say we, it was uh, the airport, the, uh, Molly from the chamber, and her staff, and our consultants. Uh, and we met with carriers, multiple carriers, both uh, Legacy, Regional, and ULCC back in March uh, to pitch our case to add uh, uh, at that time and increase uh, service uh, based on data. So, you know, we, we're not just doing this off the cuff. Um, so then carriers go back, they do their own research, and if favorable, discussions lead to negotiations where we are today. So our current uh, ULCC flight proposal is, as uh, City Manager Van Milligan uh, mentioned, is four flights a week to Florida, two to Orlando, two to Fort Myers on an aircraft, on a 737 aircraft. Um, and also, Mike had mentioned that out of our, I guess he didn't mention, but he did provide the numbers, um, out of our top five destinations from our catchment area, which is showing that uh, the circle on the right in purple there, um, that uh, Orlando is number one and Fort Myers is number four as of 2021. In 2021, a total of over 37,000 passengers from the Dubuque area to Orlando and Fort Myers, and out of our top 25 destinations, over 52,000 additional uh, passengers flew to other Florida airports, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, um, from our competing airports. So um, for, from local uh, regional airports to uh, Chicago here. Some of those, um, some of those destinations. Is touch screen? No. Hang on a second. I just wanted to make mention of some of those other airports. Are number three Tampa, number eight Miami, number fifteen Fort Lauderdale, number eighteen Saint Petersburg, number nineteen is Orlando, so Saint Pierre, which is a little bit different from um, 
uh, Orlando MCO, and number 22, Punta Gorda. And you could actually look into our top uh, 50 and come up with some additional numbers. So um, obviously, uh, when we were making this pitch, and even as of early last week, when, uh, or when the commission was approving this uh, earlier in the month of, uh, in um, September, and when we were putting this presentation, we didn't, you know, we didn't guess that there would be a hurricane doing the damage that it had done last week uh, to our friends in uh, Fort Myers, especially on the coastal. So, um, you know, we have, um, I've got a meeting scheduled tomorrow to talk with the ULCC, um, working with other airports that are currently providing service to Fort Myers, uh, Florida. They are offering alternatives. So, for example, um, right now, I just mentioned that um, Orlando is number one and Fort Myers is number four. Um, Tampa would be another great um, uh, alternate to uh, Fort Myers while they assess their damage and come up with a schedule for rebuilding and things like that. So um, I, I assume that's going to be a question that's coming out or, uh, <laughs> or you know, on top of, top of mind, so I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that. <coughs> so we respectfully request approval for the minimum revenue guarantee funds of $250,000 a year for two years or a total of uh, $500,000. Uh, some of those benefits are to restore commercial air service and regain passenger traffic, um, which obviously uh, when American left, um, we have very little. We still have our destinational charters um, that are working on Sun Country to, um, you know, like your Biloxi. Laughlin and Atlantic City, and also some private uh, charters, but um, a big negative impact over the total amount. Uh, reduce ne uh, negative economic impact to our airport and community to protect our airport federal funding. Uh, and when we say protect airport federal funding, um, what I'm referring to is the airport improvement program. And when I come up and talk to you during our budget presentations, you notice there's a lot of of work that's being done at the airport and that's using those funds. And typically they're 90% federal funds and we bring back a 10% local match. But that's all based on emplainments. So you have to have 10,000 emplainments or more to receive a million dollars. If you have 10,000 or less, you receive $250,000. So that's a significant impact by the loss of the, uh, of the emplainments. So, um, uh, provide access to quality of life amenity, uh, uh, employer workforce recruitment and retention tool, increase, retain more of the market share of Dubuque's catchment area to demonstrate profitability and add future ULCC routes and potential scheduled daily service. So with that, I thank you again for allowing us to provide an update and we appreciate your support and happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much, Todd and Molly. Before I open it up to questions, I just want to mention, um, you, you both deserve a ton of credit for the work that you have done, and not just since we learned uh, from American Airlines what has been going on or that they were going to leave Dubuque, but before that as well. Uh, the work that, Todd, you do at the airport, obviously um, incredibly important in doing this. You mentioned even some of the things that you did to um, uh, try and court airlines before the pandemic. Um, and, and Molly, the, the, you and the chamber and the Air Service Task Force, I think it's really important that we point that out, that the work that you're doing is incredibly important to the community. Um, this is obviously not a situation we'd like to be in, but here we are and looking for solutions. So with that said, I'll go ahead and open it up for a discussion and questions. Ms. Farber. Yeah. So, Todd, thank you very much for um, the work and also for the presentation. And, of course, we did have the conversation about the question about what's going to happen in Florida. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that so that we can see uh, where that extension uh, would be going down to that area. Um, the other question I have is that the, um, the um, revenue guarantee that the city of Dubuque uh, would, that we're voting on tonight is 250000 a year. Um, what happens if the county does not basically assist in its um, participation here? Yeah, um, you know, I think we would go with our best foot forward and, and take the offer that we have um, that's been approved. Um, but, um, you know, that, that might not be enough to uh, ink the deal. Would you come back to the city then at that point? Or how, how are the negotiations or what was your, what is the 
um, next step or the yeah, um, um, we had a uh, uh, Molly and I attended the uh, County of Supervisors <coughs> meeting just this morning mm -hmm. um, and they did have a motion second and unanimous to put a resolution on for their uh, next um, Monday I believe it would be okay. uh, meeting um, and I feel uh, the conversation was very favorable okay, so you believe there'll be countywide support then as well hopefully yes. okay thank you You're welcome Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones couple of comments. Um, we'll have to understand that a revenue guarantee isn't just here's the money. It's uh, if we don't get the employments that are projected, um, we'll subsidize you a little bit. It's not, uh, it's not we're giving you a, a half million dollars a year just to fly here. We've got it available if people don't choose to use the service. Um, and a revenue guarantees are something we've talked about for years to try and keep American here and do other things. Um, most of the other services that you're offering I think we're also, I know you bought all the ground equipment to service American. I know that uh, a number of the things that you did were there to service American. And I, I guess the biggest thing that I want the community to understand is this is a this is a nice plus. This is something we've been talking about for years, getting some low cost carriers to fly to exotic destinations. And they'll be exotic again after the hurricane is cleaned up. And uh, so it's a plus. It's something we've been looking for for a while. It also isn't the solution that we're looking for. It's a piece of the puzzle. And we got to remember that. A number of the communications that we got from citizens this weekend um, were basically ones that read the story in the paper and, and kind of understood it. It was well written and explained it. But it it, it sounded like, going to Florida, we're done. Yeah, no. Boy, we're not done. This is just a step in the right direction. Um, and done's going to take a while. Um, everything that Todd told you is absolutely true. The carriers don't have pilots. They don't have aircraft. And... If you're going to service, provide air service, you need both of those two things. Now, I'd argue that that's their fault that they don't have a lot of that, um, but that's not for tonight. Tonight's argument is about, um, I don't think it's going to be much of an argument, tonight's, tonight's discussion is about how can we get some air service back to Dubuque that will benefit some people some of the time while we continue to work on getting more air service back to Dubuque that will benefit all of us. So this is a positive step. Can't wait to vote yes. Thanks for your good work. Thank you, Councilman. Mr. Mayor? Mr. Resnick. Thank you. Um, so this, if we uh, approve this, the uh, be um, January 1st is when this begins? Uh, no. So, yeah, so obviously we're still in negotiations. After we execute the agreement, um, hopefully execute the agreement, um, obviously there wasn't a, 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 strong, a, a solid timeline there because we had to jump through a uh, couple more processes, if you will, by, by when you get, go to get a minimum revenue guarantee, you had to work through the city and the county, which, by the way, um, the person I'm negotiating with um, did make the comment that, um, he, he, the comment that, so you're working with the chamber and a development corporation and a travel uh, agency, or not agency, but travel Dubuque, the city and the county, you're all working together to make this happen. This is this is like unheard of in his world. He's like, usually it's like you and one partner or somebody comes in and says, yep, they're gonna get behind this and support it. So we're a little bit different. I, I explained that we had to go through these processes on the city and county level um, and you know work for support. So, um, so it kind of threw the timeline off just a little bit, but essentially once we execute the agreement, um, with them, then we can talk, okay, our pilot availability is this, our aircraft availability is this. Um, typically, um, in, in any new market, you'd want to have a couple of months of advertising, marketing, getting your ground handling all established. It's, that's going to take a little bit of time. So um, I would imagine probably uh, first quarter calendar year 2023 that service would start, um, and then locations would be pending um, you know, Fort Myers, of course, is the big question mark right now. But as I mentioned, they um, are going to provide uh, potential uh, alternate opportunities. So we've got a, a target of 10,000 employments. And so if we have four flights a week, that's, you know, somewhere around 50 and an average of 50. Does that sound very doable to you, 50 people uh, per flight? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we'd want to have a lot more than 50 people per flight for it to be successful. So, um, you know, what sometimes we use load factors to um, kind of judge the success of a flight. We haven't gotten there um, with them yet. There's a lot of uh, factors and variables that go in uh, to that. Everything from the price of the ticket to the leg of the flight to how much is fuel costs 
uh, that that day or how much that it's going for per barrel, um, you know, wages, all, all that other stuff. So um, yeah, I would I would hope you know. 80% load factors on a 737 with 190 people that say, um, oh, absolutely, we would have four flights a day. Uh, early, uh, and I, I have the information exact in here, I can get it to you, but basically, we would be back to pre-pandemic levels as far as emplainments, so, um, which would be amazing, right? So that that's... If I answered your question, okay, I hope I well, did. Yes, we will be plus the 10,000 for sure, and potentially at about an 80% load factor at four flights a week, we would be back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, which thank we had you, and American. I appreciate all the, the work that the, the group together uh, is doing. I appreciate Molly Grover from our five-star chamber coming tonight to talk about uh, how important it is to business community and to the entire community. Uh, so a question, I know you're, ta you're thinking about next steps, um, and is this the best? Is this the best idea right now? And you've come forward with this. And uh, the idea. I'm glad you have a, a group working with you because we have citizens who are also very interested, and they give you a lot of uh, comments. And what, one that I got from a citizen was, "Well, could we possibly secure a gate at O'Hare ourselves and have some kind of a shuttle and, and privately contract?" Uh, a, a jet like we're currently using is is that the next step is that a possibility we've looked into that as well as this very good idea we have yeah. here tonight yeah we're not ex all all stones are being overturned right that nothing's everything's on the table so if it's a legacy carrier if it's a regional carrier which um, some people know the names like a, a cape air or denver air or boutique air or something like that um can I answer 100% uh, that we would guarantee a gate in Chicago? No, but I would say with all the reductions in service that there'd, there'd be gate availability. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. you. Yeah, Ms. Rousseau. Thank you for all of that information. Um, I think that um, one of the things we need to do is to keep our Dubuque Airport top of mind for people in our area. When we, we want to think fly Dubuque. When you want to go somewhere, you want to think Dubuque. You don't want to get in the habit of going somewhere else for your travel needs. And I know, as Mr. Jones said, this problem is going to take both short and long-term solutions, but I, I think we need to take some action now and invest in our airport for all the reasons that you mentioned in your presentation and to be in alignment with the the leaders in our community like Greater Dubuque Development and the Chamber and our, and our city manager. And I, I think the Greater Dubuque Development said it best in their in their letter to us and they said, we need to invest in a future where our citizens can access the world from the Dubuque Regional Airport and in return, the world can access us. So I would love to support this as our first step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wethel. Um, <clears throat> as it was mentioned earlier, uh, as part of goal setting in August, uh, Air Service Future Strategy and Action Plan um, was a top priority for us. And um, as our community, I, I'm really impressed with the process of goal setting because what we're really doing is taking what people tell us is important to Dubuque and executing it into a plan for our community to work together on, mm -hmm. um, specifically our city employees. Uh, the privilege now is that we get the opportunity less than two months later to vote on a first step. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I'm really blown away with the expeditious um, and just very, very driven community leadership that we've had. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who's invested in this. And so we get to say yes. But I agree, there have been many concerns voiced um, from constituents that this isn't enough. And they're right. They are 100% right. But I want everyone to know that we have to start somewhere. And at the end of this, you know what? We might be have better air service than we have ever had in this community. And I think that that's our goal. Um, one question I had, and. I don't know that this is something that you can discuss because it puts a little bit of the cart before the horse, but at the end of 24 months, 
What happens next? Do they judge our plan that is the next step after that time based on employments? Mm -hmm. Just if you could give me a 30,000 foot sure. view of that. Yeah, no, 30,000, we can do that from an airport, <laughs> maybe, right? So um, yeah, no, obviously we both have to be successful. Um, it's not our intent to burn through a minimum revenue guarantee in a year or even two years. Our goal is to make this a success so that we no longer have to have a minimum revenue guarantee after those two years and they survive on their own. So that's what I would envision after um, 24 months that we're successful, it's doing well. Not only are we no, no longer required a minimum revenue guarantee, but maybe we're looking to add another service, maybe westbound um, or, or something like that. So that's my 30,000. I'd be happy to descend if you'd like, but. Uh, We'll do that next. Okay, sounds good. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so you. much. I'm gonna see how many airport puns we can work into this yep, conversation. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Spring. Um, thank you to everyone that's been working on this. Somewhere is better than nowhere at this point, and I am glad that this is the first step. So, um, a couple quick questions, and if you can't answer, my understand right now because you're still in negotiations. Mm -hmm. Did they? Did the carrier kind of give any idea as to cost on these flights? Like it's going to cost this much? And yeah, uh, you're talking ticket price. Yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, as an ultra low cost carrier, um, they will be in uh, direct competition with other ultra low cost carriers in our area and even Chicago Hair. So. You can kind of, and I don't hold me to the dollar amount, obviously, but you can compare them to, um, recently I saw a $70 one-way fare to Florida. Um, so obviously they'll be very competitive with that, if not beating that, especially at the early stages of, you know, uh, building market share and ridership. I would say that they're probably going to be beating those fares, but um, ultimately it'll be the ultra low cost carrier model where you're in the $60, $70 range one way, obviously, Assume you're coming back, so you have to double that, but um, that's the general um, airfare range. And you mentioned four flights a week. Are they going to probably bring bring the flight up and then turn around the next day kind of idea? Um, yep. Yeah, so they will not, um, we call it RON, so they will not um, spend the night in Dubuque. So they'll, for example, they would originate in Orlando, fly up to Dubuque with a load of passengers, presumably. Maybe the second flight, maybe not the first flight might be empty, but um, and then on the way back, take uh, passengers down, and that would be one flight. Okay. So, and then it would be uh, very similar to your ultra low cost uh, carrier models that you've seen. So, they would fly on a Thursday, Sunday. I'm just going to throw those two uh, days of the week out there. So, you have the option to leave on a Thursday, come back on a Sunday, or you could stay for a week and come back the following Thursday, or um, maybe you have a, a second residence down there, you fly out in the fall, come back in the spring, or come back and visit family during the holidays. Um, but that's kind of the good news about having the two destinations four times a week. You could potentially even fly into Orlando and then fly back out on, on uh, Fort Myers or something like that if that fits your schedule better. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I want to let you know in casual conversation with the County Board of Supervisors Chair Harley Potoff the other day, he was excited about the opportunities to market Dubuque to Florida because mm -hmm. those planes fly two ways. And, uh, you know, there's not, not real good skiing in, in uh, Orlando or Fort Myers. <laughs> Maybe we can get those folks up here. And the dream. once yeah, the they dream. come up to ski, we can show them a riverfront that will dazzle them a little bit and, and some uh, entertainment options. So hopefully it becomes a two-way street, and I kind of kind of like the way he's thinking. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I wanted to separate these two because this is a personal situation, <laughs> and that is I, my wife and I flew to England, and we had a round trip, and we flew out of Dubuque, but we came back after September 7th, so we had to, you know, stop in Chicago, get a rented car, and, and come back. And it just, it just reminded us that how important for leisure, either in leisure services and, and, and leisure travel, that we have a, a, a wonderful airport here in Dubuque and we couldn't get there, you know, and uh, uh, the, the flight out was fantastic. Everything is going really great out at the Dubuque airport. And then not to be able to come back, it didn't make us angry. It just made us uh, more determined than ever that we need to get air service back here. And I know, I know it's important for businesses. Uh, and it is important for those people 
uh, you know, for leisure services as well, leisure travel. So thank you again for all Can your I efforts. Can I add to that too? So these negotiations were going on before American made that announcement. So um, we were discussing this deal knowing that we had daily scheduled service for our business and leisure. So, and they were still, you know, willing to come to Dubuque. So this didn't happen just because of American leaving. I just wanted to make sure that I don't, can't remember if anybody mentioned that or not, but we will continue to, to seek out daily scheduled service to a hub. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> you mentioned something that I think is really important in this conversation, Todd. You said um, that the folks you're talking to at the airline made a point to mention how we're doing things in approaching this as a city of Dubuque and how that's actually unique. Um, I think we need to be reminded of that sometimes because it's just so normal for us to do it this way. You know, on this agenda item alone, we have not only uh, the support of our city manager recommending that we vote for this, but we also have the support of the, the Chamber of Commerce um, and Molly and the Air Service Task Force. We have support of the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, the DRA, you mentioned Travel Dubuque. Everybody that I talk to is supportive of the idea that we're not, we're not going quietly on this one. We are going to work until we get our air service back, plain and simple. Is this getting our air service back? Not entirely, not entirely. And that's been set up here, and I think it's important to reiterate this. This approach that is being taken by the community members that are all working on this together is a multi-pronged approach. We're not just talking about leisure service. We're not just talking about going to Florida. We're talking about the possibility of getting, we're talking about getting, not the possibility of, we're talking about getting air service back to major hubs through major carriers at the Dubuque Regional Airport. And we're also talking about working with other communities to get this done. Not to, um, I, I definitely don't want to forget to work with our, our federal legislators because this is a federal legislative issue. Um, and they're working very hard on our behalf. Uh, we've talked to them multiple times. I've talked to them personally. A lot of people in this room have talked to our federal legislators personally. Um, they're, they're paying attention. They're working for us. Um, everybody kind of says the same thing. This is a problem that's going to take a while to fix in, in its entirety. And to, to a point, I get that. Uh, but I've also heard people say that, you know, when you tell us two years before we're able to get air service back, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for the city of Dubuque. And we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, we're going to keep fighting for this. But as we fight, we're going to do it as partners. We're doing it as partners with our, our legislators. We're doing it as partners with the airlines themselves. Um, we're not making enemies in this. I, I think it's important that we don't talk about this in that way, but that we talk about it in terms of partnership for a community that is like ours. Because we are in a great spot. We're, we're, not, we're not dwindling. We're not dying on the vine. We are growing. We are improving. We're sitting here with a, a city council that gets along. I hear that's a rare thing these days, <laughs> from what I understand. And that's the way it works in our community, too. There's so much that we're doing that is... I think incredibly attractive for, to, to create air service that's going to last and to continue to go to everywhere we need to go in the United States. The people of Dubuque deserve connection to the entire country through our air service. And that's what we're gonna work to get. So the, the main thing I want people to walk away with from this discussion is that this is one piece of the puzzle it's, it's incredible, as Ms. Wethel pointed out, it's incredible that we are doing this already after just having the loss of air service, that this is already coming along. Uh, I know the negotiations were happening, but the fact that we're moving this along speaks volumes to the work that you're doing. And I think it's really important that we recognize that. But we are not even close to done. We're gonna continue to work on all the different aspects that we need to work on to make sure that air service returns to Dubuque in its entirety and even more than what we had before. Because I think that's where we're going. I think we're going to a place where we're going to have connections to major hubs, we're going to have connections to leisure locations, and we're going to uh, be able to, to be uh, an example that other airports can follow. Because I think that we're really building that. Um, final thing I definitely want to say, because I know everybody's thinking it, but I, I want to make sure that we say it out loud too. You know, we're talking about Florida here as we talk about this in a week when Florida has absolutely been devastated. I, I don't know if everybody's been looking at the pictures that I've been seeing um, with the hurricane that went through, but we are all thinking of the people of Florida, um, our, our future partners in both Fort Myers and Orlando and any other city that we're able to fly to in Florida. I think it's important that we recognize the, the challenges they're going through. Um, we aren't 
it's, it seems strange sometimes to have this kind of a conversation after so much devastation. Um, but at the same time, I think we're all moving in the same direction of we're going to continue to rebuild the state of Florida altogether and be able to, to have a good partner there too. So just want everybody to know that we're thinking of that as well. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to voting for this. I think this is a great step. This is going to be just a, a wonderful move in the right direction. I think we've got a lot of work left to do, and I, I know we're going to do it. That's just the way it's going to be. Any other discussion? Okay. Well, thank you for your presentation, Todd and Molly. We really appreciate that. So the motion is to receive and file and approve. Um, motion made by Roussel and seconded by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is Experience Schmidt Island, Mississippi River Outdoor Amphitheater and Island Trails Project Destination Iowa Grant Application. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I will receive and file the documents, hear the presenta see the presentation, and approve the, the recommendation. Second by Sprank. A motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. In August 2022, the City Council reaffirmed that the implementation of the Schmidt Island Master Plan is a priority. City staff led by Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware and Director of Strategic Partnerships Terry Goodman have been working for months with Dubuque Racing Association or DRA President and CEO Alex Dixon to develop a plan for the next phase of the implementation of the Schmidt Island Master Plan. The over $3 million expansion of the Veterans Memorial has been a huge success, and the over $6 million repair and enhancement of the Mystique Ice Center is under construction. The Ice Center major facility upgrade will include the installation of air conditioning, making the facility usable on a year-round basis and making it able to host much more diverse events. Members of the city staff on the Destination Iowa grant team has included City Attorney Krenna Brumwell, Finance and Budget Director Jennifer Larson, Planning Services Manager Wally Wernemont, Economic Development Director Jill Connors, and Project Manager Steve Sampson Brown. Greater Dubuque Development Corporation Representative Dave Lyons has also participated. The grant was written by East Central Intergovernmental Association Executive Director Kelly Detmeyer and ECIA Project Manager Dan Lobianco. The Destination Iowa grant application has received letters of support from the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, Crescent Community Health Center, the Community Foundation of Greater Dubuque, East Central Intergovernmental Association, Prosperity Eastern Iowa, Travel Dubuque, and the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. The Dubuque Racing Association is committing matching funds of $3,658,000 towards the dog track deconstruction, marquee signage, and surface parking upgrades. The city of Dubuque will be providing $6 million in debt financing to the project. However, the DRA will provide the money to make the debt payments. The Experience Schmidt Island, Mississippi River Outdoor Amphitheater and Island Trails Project Destination Iowa grant application is requesting $7,305,440 in Destination Iowa grants of an $18,353,500 development that will enhance outdoor recreational activities and increase tourism opportunities on Schmidt Island and in the state of Iowa. This project will create a recreational landmark and a gateway from Wisconsin into Iowa, connecting people to economic opportunities and key recreational assets. Schmidt Island is Dubuque's gateway to entertainment and the Mississippi River, it is a connected island that welcomes visitors and community to recreation, entertainment, and the outdoors. The proposed project will create a signature destination and a front door to Dubuque and Iowa. This project is designed to be the iconic outdoor recreational gateway that will connect tourists to the Mississippi River and create a sense of place, improving the island's overall amenities and attractions. The new outdoor amphitheater will host paid concerts as well as hosting community events for nonprofit entities, schools, and local charities. The community events are typically free with any proceeds going to a nonprofit charity that the event is supporting. This Schmidt Island project will update and enhance the existing trails and extend them to better connect both ends of Schmidt Island, connect the amphitheater with the trail system, 
add lighting, signage, and ensuring the entire trail system is ADA compliant. This will promote biking, walking, and running on the island. The Schmidt Island Trails are a free source of recreation that anyone can enjoy, both residents and tourists alike. The trails will connect to the newly completed Veterans Memorial Plaza. The Greater Dubuque Development Corporation recently launched You Can Be Great Here campaign, designed to retain, recruit, and create the talented workforce that we must have for continued economic growth. The Schmidt Island Outdoor Amphitheater and Recreational Trails Project are critical components to creating a community of choice. Schmidt Island is an employment center for Dubuque and surrounding areas. Alternative transportation options are particularly important to millennials, low-income residents, and people who do not own vehicles in Dubuque. Through this project, greater connectivity to the island will occur, allowing for safer alternative forms of transportation with the enhanced trails for biking and walking to work and leisure. With the addition of the outdoor amphitheater and eliminating the current backwater stage, which is a surface parking lot uh, concert venue, it is estimated that total attendance per summer will increase from 2022 attendance of 19,337 people with seven show events to 3,300 people per event with the ability to host nine shows per year. The total attendance averaging 30,000 people annually over a five year time span. In addition, the local community events will bring in another 11,500 people per year. <clears throat> Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic in 2019, Attendance to average 60,800 people total annually at ice hockey events. The backwater stage in 2022 had over 15,800 attendees at their public concert events. The Hilton Garden Inn had over 35,693 room nights. The Miller Riverview camp Campground has gone from 5,512 campsites rented to 7,986 in 2021. The number of adult visitors increased from 12,361 to 17,611 during that same time period. Prior to COVID-19 in 2019, an average visitor spent $381 per day in tourism spending while in Dubuque. Over the first five years after these improvements, it is anticipated there will be 150,000 people who will attend ticketed events at the new amphitheater with 75,000 of these from out of town. This would equate, equate to almost $23 million in direct out of town visitor spending. In this five year period, this project will support a total of $58 million in regional economic output and 342 jobs. I respectfully recommend Mayor and City Council approval of the experienced Schmidt Island Mississippi River Outdoor Amphitheater and Islands Trail Project destination Iowa grant application, DRA President and CEO Alex Dixon and Terry Goodman, a Director of Strategic Partnerships will make a presentation. All right. Good evening. Thank you, Mike. And um, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Terry Goodman. I'm the Director of Strategic <laughs> Partnerships. I'm here to open the presentation this evening, which will describe the Destination Iowa grant application for additional Schmidt Island developments, which were just outlined in Mike's memo. The redevelopment of Schmidt Island into a recreational destination for tourists and Dubuque residents alike is a city council priority. I would like to recognize and thank the team of city staff, especially Marie Ware, Steve Brown, Jill Connors, Wally Wernemond, and our uh, support services from Kelly Detmeyer and Dan Lobianco at ECIA. And now I would like to pass this presentation uh, uh, to Alex Dixon, who is a dynamic new leader in our community and who has led this effort uh, with great skill. So Alex. Thank you, Terry. Uh, again, uh, Alex Dixon, uh, President and CEO at Q Casino and DRA. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with council um, as uh, well as Mr. Mayor, uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Uh, I'm here joined by uh, our director of Schmidt Island Development. Um, you uh, also know her as our uh, director of grants uh, here, um, uh, excuse me, strategic philanthropy uh, with the DRA, Kathy Burr, as well as our board chair, Kevin Lynch. I think he's no uh, 
uh, no stranger to you all here in this body. But it's a pleasure to be here. We'll walk through uh, the presentation, but it's um, so grateful for this opportunity for our organizations that are really inextricably linked. And so uh, this presentation is really a modified version of what uh, I'm blessed to be able to share with a lot of, whether it's outside investors or other groups who are looking to invest within, uh, within uh, um, our city here within Dubuque. Uh, and we use this, uh, Marie, Kathy, uh, and Terry, we had an opportunity to sit uh, with the Iowa Economic Development Authority group um, some time ago to really preview this. And so uh, it was well received then, and I'm hopeful that uh, with your approval here tonight, we'll be able to submit a great application um, to be able to secure these funds. So a little bit about City of Dubuque. I you know, don't need to educate uh, this body, uh, as you all, but it's something that I, I share with great pride that on our board at the DRA, we are joined by uh, Mayor Brad Kavanaugh, Rick Jones, and Danny Sprank. Uh, but overall, our relationship with the, with the city is just amazing. And so you have done a phenomenal job through goal setting to, uh, whether it's approve a new 15-year lease, dedicating one-third of the profits from uh, the DRA to Schmidt Island. Uh, you've listed Schmidt Island as a, as a top priority, um, and we thank you for that. Um, uh, what I'm also grateful for is that every single one of you have been uh, down to Schmidt Island doing the tour, physically seeing um, what you're gonna be uh, uh, voting on here tonight. And so that level of, of dedication, whether it's planting trees or coming down um, or serving on a board, whether it's at the, the ICE Center, is, is truly uh, impactful and we're grateful for it. Uh, but I also remind that this body back in 2014 approved uh, a master plan that implied well over $500 million of development. Um, and so the action that you took last year by dedicating one third of the profits to this effort is that we are going uh, to not only just talk about opportunity, but we're gonna put it in action. Uh, uh, next, it falls down to the city staff. And so we've uh, been very fortunate, uh, literally on a weekly basis, to engage not only uh, with the folks you see here on the screen, but uh, we're growing. We added Anderson and Neighborhood um, Services uh, not too long ago uh, because it's going to be important the minute as we go and, and flesh out our plans that we're in the neighborhoods to be able to connect people to jobs, connect people to, uh, to so many things. But uh, the staff has advocated for improvements to the Community Ice Center. Um, uh, we meet weekly with the staff to do the big projects like this, uh, which is apply for funds all the way down to how can we work with Steve Sampson Brown um, to not wait for the big federal grant to improve lighting? Are there light poles that we can put up uh, today uh, to be able to help move things forward? Um, but the staff is constantly seeking state funds, um, uh, state and federal funds to be able to help us approve. We also are within uh, an opportunity zone. Uh, we speak to investors about how we might be able to develop financial structures to take advantage of that federal program. Um, what I also share when we're talking to investors, they ask to say, hey, what is your relationship like with the city? What is it like with the county, within the state? And uh, uh, I'm very fortunate to be able to say, we all get along, we work together, there's a great partnership. But not only that is take a look at this slide here, which shows we have the lowest property taxes among major cities within the state of Iowa. And it is, um, it is due uh, to this body's to the staff and uh, fiscal leadership, but it's also due to the fact that we have this great partnership with the DRA that we effectively own the profits of, uh, of a casino. Um, and so to that end, we have the lowest um, uh, property taxes. But as we, as we sit here today, this is about let's not um, just rest on our laurels that we've got the lowest taxes. We need the amenities. If you look at the right side of that column, there are communities within our state that have much higher taxes than we do but are growing at a higher rate. They're doing a better job at keeping their young people when they graduate from their schools and colleges in their communities. They're doing a better job at getting people to move from the rural parts of our state to their communities. Um, and so what is grateful that we're here talking about today is we have the ability to stay in this position of low taxes while gaining amenities that are gonna help us be able to better recruit and retain not only our workforce, but grow our population, but do so without having to raise taxes. So a little bit about the DRA. Uh, in short, we are here, if you look at our vision, we are a dynamic community resource acting as a catalyst to enhance the quality of life and financial well-being for the tri-state community. 
Uh, we happen to manage casinos. We happen to manage a hotel. We happen uh, to manage now um, uh, an ice arena, which we'll uh, talk uh, a little bit further later today. But we are here to make Dubuque better. And so today's proposal is squarely within, within that line. What you're looking at is uh, the Veterans Memorial. Um, it was a, it, what we embarked upon um, not too long ago, but we've got to um, continue on and implement the plan that you all have asked us to do. We're led by a, 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 an unpaid board of directors, Kevin Lynch, who joins me today. Um, and we are blessed to have uh, an original board member, Ron Herrick, who's been with us since 1984. Um, this is something, this organization is unique. The DRA, uh, I'll be speaking uh, in Las Vegas, my hometown, uh, next week, specifically about a nonprofit casino. And guess what? No one has ever heard about it within our industry. It's something that is commonplace to us, but they said, hey, we want you on the main stage to be able to talk about what's going on in Dubuque, simply because this is a model that, quite frankly, I believe, and others, um, can replicate in other parts of, of our country. Because it's a way that we can do and replicate what we just saw on that previous page, is that we have the ability to keep, business, keep taxes low so our businesses can, can grow and have uh, great amenities that we can bring here. Uh, we have a great team, uh, Brian Rakestraw, who's been here for a very long time, Stacy Kansku, who literally has a home in Fort Myers and just moved to Dubuque two weeks ago. She is now our head of marketing. Um, thankfully, she was and her family is okay, um, but uh, it hit, hits home in that uh, we were all concerned about her as well as John Torres, who's our head of hospitality, who's uh, his wife lives down there as well. Uh, but since our founding back in 84, 85, we've had over a $1 billion impact um, to, to our community. Um, and so the biggest uh, uh, advocates, or excuse me, the biggest recipients are our employees. Uh, but next was to the state of Iowa. So we are putting in an application to the state of Iowa uh, for a grant for in the tune a little over $7 million. I think it's important that we all remember that since our founding, we've sent from this community $300 million to the state of Iowa directly from Dubuque and the, uh, the citizens here. Second, um, we've been able through uh, one $7 million investment that this body approved back in 84 and 85, we've returned from the DRA $223 million to the city of Dubuque. Um, and that's a big portion as to why our property taxes are low. You see uh, the, a big portion of our funds have gone to the kennel owners, which we all know that this was the last year where we ran the, um, uh, the dogs, uh, but $60 million to charitable organizations. Um, and then you see up in the note to the, to the left is to the county, uh, given $9 million to the county, but $16 million to the bondholders uh, as, as well. So in short, uh, the DRA, uh, the combined efforts of both Q Casino and Diamond Joe have a significant role uh, within our community as well as within our state because second to income taxes in the state of Iowa are gaming revenues. There are 19 commercial casinos within the state um, and so not manufacturing, not agriculture uh, is such a big component, component to our state revenues and here we're going to ask that this group approve an application so that we can go ask for that state to make a reinvestment within us. So about Schmidt Island, um, this is just a beautiful uh, overview of the island that we want to get into the homes of people within, within Chicago, within Madison, within Iowa City, within Des Moines, uh, and then really right here within Dubuque. I think when you come over to, uh, whether it's the racetrack or you come over um, to Catfish Charlie's or to the ice arena, you don't really have a full appreciation for quite really the beauty and the majesty of Schmidt Island. Um, but this, with marketing, with um, support, we want to become Dubuque's gateway to entertainment in the Mississippi, uh, a connected island that welcomes visitors uh, in our community to recreation, entertainment, and the outdoors. And so literally right <laughs> over this road, people drive right through our town and our community to get up to the Wisconsin Dells, right? They come in from, uh, uh, from Wisconsin to be able to go to other parts or uh, you know, over the other bridge into Illinois. Uh, and today we are a day trip um, uh, for, uh, for Galena. Um, meaning Dubuque is. And so I think all, over time, we need to take our rightful place uh, on the mighty Mississippi to make sure that we're creating a, a great destination um, so that folks can come and visit us and go and visit the, the surrounding community. Uh, no need to, to uh, belabor the history of Schmidt Island, but just as a quick reminder, this was the airport. 
At one point in time, when we thought differently about our river, it was the city dump. Um, and then it, it, over time, it evolved into leisure and recreation. And what I would share with this group, it is this body's uh, responsibility and ours as a community to define what are the next steps uh, of this island. Uh, and it's our generation's res responsibility uh, to define the next phase uh, that would be on this page. Uh, it kicked off with the great leadership of, of uh, my board chair, Kevin Lynch, as well as the DRA board, um, to privately fundraise $3.4 million of a project by the D DRA. And it is <laughs> phenomenal. But I think it's a good testament as to why we're here today. Um, because we, the DRA, we are effectively a pass-through organization. The city of Dubuque owns the land. And just like this Veterans Memorial, the city of Dubuque owns the land under the memorial. But in order to develop that, we had to go to a local bank, and they said, hey, Alex, you don't own the land, you don't uh, have any uh, uh, assets directly tied there, so we're gonna offer you a loan over a shorter period of time at a higher rate. Um, and so tonight what we're talking about is how can we achieve improvements to the island just like this, but do it over a longer period of time at a lower rate so that we can give more money back to the city and less money to uh, an outside uh, private institution. That's at the core of what we're asking to do here tonight. Next is a trail project uh, secured by State Representative Ashley Henson. This is a, a phenomenal addition that the city of Dubuque is going to administer. Um, and uh, we can't wait eventually to have a kickoff ceremony and working with our, our, uh, you, our partners, to help add this component to the Veterans Memorial. It will be right outside of the, um, uh, of the ICE Center. And uh, Ashley Henson reads, I'm proud to have secured funding to help Dubuque finish the Chaplain Schmidt Island Trail Connection, a longtime infrastructure priority in the uh, community that honors a local World War II hero. Next, uh, the city has done a phenomenal job of applying for a Department of Transportation grant. We were very fortunate as a community to, to receive that. This downtown roadway project will improve vehicle and pedestrian bridge over 14th Street, a bike path to Kerper Boulevard. It will improve traffic flow on 16th Street. We'll add new sidewalks uh, along the roadways. And so you'll see that there's some roundabouts that will be uh, proposed along Elm Street. Uh, as well as improvements to roundabouts along 16th Street, but a, a super critical uh, overpass over uh, along 14th Street to make sure that as uh, the railroad traffic increases in our community, that we don't cut off uh, a critical aspect um, um, to, um, to this North End corridor. This is what brings us to uh, Destination Iowa. And so up until this point, you've heard that we've already secured federal funds in the form of the DOT planning grant. We've already um, uh, secured an earmark um, from uh, Ashley Henson. The city, you all are doing a phenomenal job already of investing within this island. And now this next step is to be able to approach the state to, be, uh, to advocate for the outdoor recreation fund within Destination Iowa. Um, so uh, Governor Reynolds has approved $100 million uh, in four different categories. The one we are applying for is outdoor recreation. And uh, with the help and support of Kelly Detmeyer, Dan, and team at ECIA, we've uh, here to put together a phenomenal application for your review. So in short, Experience Schmidt Island, Mississippi River Outdoor uh, Amphitheater and Islands Trails Project, uh, we are requesting $7.3 million from uh, Destina Destination Iowa as a part of an $18.3 million overall project. Um, this, this would propose within the year of, uh, of 2025, January may be a bit aggressive, here, but uh, be both the trails as well as the amphitheater, we're confident that that can get complete within 2025. But it's important to note that the applicant is the city of Dubuque. The city would be leading this project. The city would procure this project. We'd be working in coordination between the DRA and the, and the city as we have already done. But the city uh, is the best applicant specifically because you all have a great track record of receiving and administering uh, federal grants. And so to that end, this is a partnership. The city owns the land. Um, clearly the city would be uh, providing a significant portion of the funding along with the, the match. But I think it's important to note that the DRA would be supporting all financial outlays and there wouldn't be an impact on, on city taxpayers. 
So as a part of these goals, we'd have an increased foot traffic on the island, build a recreational landmark, bring people to the island, really think big, leverage the, uh, the island program, connect the island to Dubuque and region, create a year-round destination, and really create opportunities for education. Uh, we've seen these uh, within the, the public domain before, but these are just some, some renderings that give people a sense of how this area, which has over the years brought people together from our community, uh, brought families on this physical place. And so what we have an opportunity is, we had a great run with the Greyhounds. For 37 years, they did a phenomenal job of creating jobs, bringing our community together. Uh, what I've been so surprised about is how many people I meet in the community who says, I got my first job down at the Greyhound Park. Um, I, was I was 16 and I walked out the dogs. And it just shocked me uh, that this was such a critical component, not only just of the, of, uh, uh, literally the recreation provided, but literally it was a jobs program for our youth. And so by investing in an outdoor amphitheater, we have that ability to be able to bring those um, literally young people back to provide those uh, temporary one-time jobs that can help them go and be successful. Just a little bit of review of the project. Um, as you see here, just to orient everyone, you've got the current Hilton Garden Inn, uh, Hula Hands, but as we go back uh, on the left-hand side of the page here, there's a phenomenal trail that I was, you know, uh, fortunate to have many of you join me to go out there close to Heron Pond, um, as well as uh, the, the Water Sports Club. I think it's important the Water Sports Club um, uh, continues to stay. We want to help them flourish. We want them uh, to be able to have a great access way, but we would have a great access sign. This showcases that um, we could have a zigzag walkway to get down to Heron Pond, out to the pier where people could go and kayak as they do now, but really what I call merchandise this area to make sure that people know that this place is safe, it's ADA compliant, people can take their strollers. Uh, this can really become a destination in and of itself. Uh, but we would add accessible walk, uh, accessible parking, new trails, new trail lighting, uh, over to the amphitheater, um, potentially a, a, a green room and back a house, uh, but great stage, uh, um, some fixed seating, um, uh, outdoor uh, green space with trails. Um, what, I, what I love and really excited about is uh, as you go into Miller River Park, uh, we want to upgrade and provide more amenities into Miller Riverview Park. You could have a nice gathering overlook. This would be a great place to not only have a wedding ceremony or um, have uh, um, just an outdoor place to be able to experience. Uh, we move over into Festival Grounds, food truck staging. And then the, the next component is, you know, I'm b born and raised in Las Vegas and, and a, a, a proud Nevada. And we've done a phenomenal job there in that community. When you drive in from California, there's this great iconic Welcome to Las Vegas sign. It's everywhere. It's a, it's a critical part of what defines that community. And so as I moved here, one of the first things you see when you come into Wisconsin, if you make over to the left, you see this building. You don't quite know what it is, but where this location of this Iowa sign, it would be right smack dab in your face to say, hey, come, take a stop, park over, walk over. Uh, it was uh, my kid's homecoming. Uh, they're a Dubuque senior, and everybody was lined up out at the Riverwalk. I mean, it was jam-packed. Um, and so people should be there and uh, over at a, a great sign like this uh, within our facility. So how, how's it gonna, how much does it cost? Uh, what's the breakdown? So this is a great uses and sources sheet. I won't go through it all, but what this outlines uh, are is the description of the items on the left-hand side of where we get to the $18.3 million, and this is the cost. Then we see all the different partners who uh, would be participating. So the DRA would fund up to $3.658 million. This would improve the marquee signage, um, uh, uh, update the parking lot, um, deconstruct the, uh, the dog track, as well as develop one model cabin to really be able to showcase uh, what our experience could be like. Uh, there's some money that we talk about city fund, what, what, what uh, uh, city, city manager Mike Van Milligan shared um, is that some new money would be issued, but we, the DRA, would pay that back over time. And what that does is it allows us, again, to lower our cost of capital so that we don't have to do what really what uh, um, Congresswoman Ashley Henson Grant does. When we issued the debt privately to build 
the Veterans Memorial, we couldn't do it all because we paid at a higher rate at a lower period of time. We then had to go now and get a federal uh, funding from an earmark to complete the project. What this does by partnering with the city of Dubuque, we don't have to, and partnering with the state, we could be able to have a more robust project, take out a mortgage effectively, and pay that over time. Uh, the city funds, there are some funds in there that have already been earmarked through the CIP. Um, and then the Henson Grant, which we talked about, and then what we're asking for from Destination Iowa, 7.3. So that we see, by making this investment as a city, we hope that the state will provide a one-time opportunity of a 40% match. And it's not very frequently that you're able to get a 40% return on an investment that we make as a city. Very detailed amphitheater budget, but this is important as we um, submit our, um, our budget to the state, as well as the trails and signage uh, within here. Uh, we then begin to talk about our timeline for both the amphitheater as well as the trails. Uh, we have an operating budget. This clearly uh, outlines that we would have national ticketed shows, as well as great community events. I mean, if we think about a lot of the events that happen in our back parking lot today, we would have the opportunity to upgrade that and have a much better experience uh, within here. Uh, the economic impact was well stated by uh, uh, Mike during uh, the, the overview. And the last piece of this is really important that we market. Uh, and so with the DRA, we're in the marketing business. And so uh, we would be able to help partner to make sure that we're marketing this asset, marketing Dubuque, and really marketing the public amenities um, and really tying in, we, you see someone here who's riding their bike, we think a great asset is connecting this island to the Heritage Trail and really speaking about that in a, in a really connected way. Lastly, uh, I want to provide an update on the ICE Center. Um, we continue to work very closely with uh, my, my, my partner, uh, Marie Ware, who's on a much needed vacation, or much de well deserved vacation, I should say. Um, but uh, in the coming weeks, we are getting ready to kick off hockey season. November 4th, we'll welcome the, not only the Fighting Saints, but our other user groups back. And uh, really want to give you an update on the branding. Um, and so for a very long time, this uh, facility has been known as the Mystique um, Community Ice Center. And with uh, this uh, page here, we'll sh showcase with the investment that Dubuque has made in the facility. This is the, the, the Dubuque Ice Arena will be the new name. You see a little bit of the, the, the logo um, we have here. We want to have our staff who's going to be excited. Uh, the city has done a phenomenal job of investing uh, within this facility and as uh, the managers of it, we want to uh, make not only great use of that investment, but really create uh, uh, an arena, and I do say arena, uh, in the all sense of the word, that our entire community uh, can be proud. And, and to do that, you got to have a great brand. We'll have a great website um, that we'll launch uh, in line with our, uh, with our opening. Um, and we'll be back in front of this group with more updates about uh, uh, how we plan to do that. But wanted to really just share some great visuals of how we're making great strides on, on Schmidt Island. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Alex. We appreciate that presentation. Open it up for questions and discussion. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Barber. So I wanted to uh, applaud you um, for the uh, vision and mission of our gateway. Um, I think it is uh, on point. <clears throat> and as a result of our strategic planning this August, um, one of the things we talked about was the amenities to retain and attract a workforce. And this certainly, I think, is uh, paramount to that success. I think it's a key success, uh, success factor for the city to have these kinds of amenities. Um, so that we have a great place to live, work, and play. Um, and I'm also very excited about the new amphitheater, um, the ice arena, and the trail project. Um, and I know I've gone to other cities in um, Iowa where they do have an amphitheater, Cedar Rapids as an example, and the draw there is just tremendous um, for hours before, hours after, and I think this is something that is just uh, uh, a great, great benefit to the city of Dubuque. So I thank you very much, and I look forward to the partnership, and I also think it's beneficial to the city um, regarding the bond issue that we just reinforce the fact that although we are supporting the bond issue, you are actually paying the coupons uh, that become due. So I think that's a, a key to the success again and to the partnership for the payment. So thank you in advance, and I look forward to uh, supporting the project. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Thank you. So um, my understanding here is the city borrows the money, $6 million, and the DRA makes the payment over time. What is the, what is the term? Has the term been determined about over time? You know, I, I'll defer to uh, city staff on, on that. They'll have a better sense as to what they believe uh, uh, the length of the term would be and, and uh, any other potential terms that they'd be willing to share. Yeah, thank you. Um, city Manager Mike Van Milligan. Uh, the goal would be a 20-year term. That's really one of the real benefits we bring to the table because somebody like the DRA, uh, would it would be very challenging for them to borrow for 20 years. Usually there's a period of years and a balloon payment, which then, then requires refinancing. Um, and while, of course, we don't know the interest rate today because you don't know that till you issue the bonds, uh, we're thinking it would be uh, in excess of 6%, um, just based on the, the way the interest rates are headed. And uh, so I think the payment estimate was somewhere in the range of about $500,000 a year, I believe it was. So uh, that's kind of the general idea, but you know, hopefully when we issue them, it'll be a better interest rate, and, and so there'll be more attractive payments. And sometimes we're, we have been able to pay those down a little bit and get a better interest rate over time. If I recall some of the, from past years that we can turn that over as things get more favorable. Yeah, so the nice thing, another nice thing about us issuing the debt is that they have what they call a call date sometime during the 20 year period. And so if the interest rates have fallen over time, you can take advantage of that by refinancing the debt at that time, but if the interest rates went up, you don't have to refinance, which is a different situation than the DRA would be in if they have uh, a balloon payment. They have to refinance, and if the rates went up, they went up and, and they just have to pay more. Okay, thank you, and, and so the city borrows the money, DRA makes the payments, so the question is why doesn't the DRA take out the loan and make the payments? And to reiterate what you said, Mr. Dixon, you don't have any assets the DRA to really base that loan upon. The city, which of course you, um, you're a partner of obviously with the city. So th that is correct, right? That's why we, it would go on our debt. Mm -hmm. And because we have the, we own the land, you don't have assets. That's correct. In, uh, I think in an absolute terms, let's say we have some assets, but in this instance for uh, for this amphitheater, uh, we would not have um, um, assets to be able to provide the collateral that a traditional bank uh, would, would want to be able to get the terms that might just uh, outline. And, okay, and thank uh, Councilman Resnick, I would just like to add, the DRA has other plans for investment in Schmidt Island, like investment in their gaming facility and, and adding <clears throat> other components to their operation. So, uh, they, they also need to preserve their capacity to issue any debt that they do have the capability of issuing. Okay, thank you. And, um, you know, I think this is an important project. And, you know, this is, I think that we've been doing relentless improvement in the city of Dubuque for a long time. I think this is an important project. But I do want to bring up a certain, something that you said that because the city borrows some money and DR makes the impact that, I, say, I think you said no impact. I think that's a little aggressive because if it goes against our debt, it, it, it may compromise our debt reduction policy we've been doing. We, get, we had a 90%, uh, we were up to 90% now with this debt reduction policy of the uh, last few years. We're down to 50%. We don't know. I, I, I talked to Mr. Van Milligan about it. We're not sure how this is going to really uh, pan out at the end. We'll find out more budget. But I mean, if, if um, you know, I don't know how Moody's, we, nobody really knows how Moody's reacts to those kind of things. But uh, I mean, I think there is a possible impact I think we should consider, uh, but uh, the benefits far outweigh those impacts. But I do want to, I did want to bring those out and ask for comment from Mr. Van Milligan about the possibility of knowing how this might affect our debt reduction policy. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan again. Um, so the uh, city has gone from 90% use of our debt capacity down to a little bit less than 50%. I think we're at about 45%. Uh, 
And, and the nice thing about that, and we can see it with the hurricanes down in Florida, if there's ever uh, a disaster or something, you want to have some reserve debt capacity in addition to our 20% reserves of $17 million uh, to deal with those kinds of things. Um, and so the way the city council has gotten to the point where we're at today is uh, <clears throat> uh, that policy was adopted in 2015 to have a debt reduction strategy. And the way it's implemented is each year it, there's a realization that we do have to issue some debt. Um, but we retire more debt each year than we issue, and we've been successful at that since uh, the policy was adopted. Um, but when you issue debt, you always have the risk that they'll come here when you can't meet that threshold. And so I'm not suggesting tonight that you, we won't meet it, but I will suggest that we'll know through our budget process next year whether we'll meet it. And as we issue debt, it, you know, it becomes more difficult. I am recommending the issuance of this debt because I do think it's worth the investment. I do think the return on investment is tremendous. Um, and matter of fact, you know, a lot of the debt we issue are for infrastructure. And I think sometimes people have a hard time seeing the return on that. I mean, you know, burying a sewer in the ground or a water line, but we all know that's how we have good water service and good sewer service. Um, but this kind of debt, there's actually a dollar return pretty immediate. And so uh, uh, that's why I'm recommending it. But you're, you're right. During the budget process, we'll see how it affects our ability for uh, at least this next year to uh, retire more debt than we issue. Yeah. Good. And thank you both very much for that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, you. Um, just have a qualification on the budget. Sure, go ahead. For Mike, just... Um, I think it's important to note that this six million will get bundled in with some of the other CIP bonds that we do um, issue uh, next year, and it's not just a six million is a small amount for a bond issue. So this will be bundled in um, right. with other CIP projects, and I believe that is correct, right, Mike? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Yeah, Ms. Wethel. Before I start with a few remarks, um, I do <clears throat> want to ask. Approximately what percentage of our city's budget comes from the DRA? What percentage of our city budget? Well, we have the city budget in round numbers is about $240 million. And uh, I think next year we'll get about, I think about eight, eight and a half million between our rent payments and our distribution. So it's a, it's a very small part of our budget, but um, uh, Alex is right. It does help us keep the lowest property tax rate because the way it's distributed is uh, the rent payment, which is about six and a half million of that money, uh, we put directly to property tax relief. So it keeps our uh, property tax down by that much in, in rent payments. Thank you. I think we need to ask ourselves some questions about where we want to be in the next few years. <clears throat> and one would be, what is our differentiator as a community? What would make some want, someone want to come here and stay here, raise their kids here, retire here? What do we as Dubuque want to be? And when I think of our city and my ward and my neighbors, this project checks a lot of boxes for me. Creating spaces. Susan hit on it somewhat. Um, I want our citizens to enjoy the outdoors. And I want to take people out of their homes and bring them together and I want them to be at our river. That's a differentiator. Repair what is tired. Chaplain Schmidt is a beautiful place, but it needs to be lifted from a nap. Having the privilege to go down and see the space, I have to tell you, I'm embarrassed I never really understood the potential of what was there. Um, 
There is a lot of beautiful space near a river that we can't access right now that people could go and be part of our community enjoying that river. And that is what will bring people and keep them in our city. I think when people enter our state, there, you make a great point about just signage and acknowledgement of what we want our space to be and how fresh it looks. And that will make somebody pull off the road and take a break there. I travel with my kids a lot in cars. And I will tell you, having a welcoming space that just looks like a space, you know what, let's just get out and stretch our legs. And then you see, wow, look at this place. So I will, of course, vote to approve the application. And I urge my colleagues, of course, to do the same. But I urge our citizens to go to the island and be with the river now, so that three years from now, they can look at it and know what we did. So thank you, Mayor. Mr. Sprank. Yeah, yeah to echo so much of what Katie said, um, I, I felt like if we don't invest in the island, we might as well just let it go back to being a landfill. <laughs> I mean, we've gotten so much out of the DRA, this just makes sense to me to reinvest back into it to get to get this amenity. When I showed this couple pictures just to people, they're like, you mean I don't have to stand on a parking lot anymore? I like that. Um, so many people who are down at the marina want to be able to get across and do something and hang out on their boat and go to a concert and do a show. So this is just phenomenal. Um, as I've said before, if we can turn this into the, the Dells of the Iowa, let's do it. Let's make people come here. Why should I drive an hour or two hours up to the Wisconsin Dells when I can stay here, go here? So I'm all in support of this. I understand that, yes, this might, might not allow us to do some other projects, but this one is one that we could see done within two to three years. This is a no-brainer for me. I'm all for it, so thank you. Mr. Mayor, yeah, Mr. Jones. Yeah, me too. This is this is a no-brainer. This is a, this is what we got elected to to do to let people think big and and jump in to help them get there, and that's that's what's happening here. This is an exciting uh, revolution of of a space that's been underutilized and underappreciated for decades, and I'm gonna stop talking so we can start voting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, Ms. Roussel. Just a couple things to add. One, I, it's always so exciting to hear you speak, Alex. It, it's just um, so um, exciting to understand what a win-win opportunity this is for our community. And just another example of partnership, how everyone comes together to make something better. And I think Schmidt Island is just a gem waiting for the polish to bring it to life. And one of the things that I think is most exciting is that it's a source of free outdoor recreation. It's, you know, free. People can go down there and enjoy the beauty, get out, as Councilmember Wethel said, to um, walk and enjoy the river and be healthier, just to enjoy life. So I can't wait to, to vote and see what's going to happen down there. Thanks for your leadership. Yeah, Mr. Very quickly, ahead. I just wanted to shout out to Kevin Lynch, who um, a couple of years ago sat in with us at Goals and Priority as a temporary council member. And uh, he was eloquent in why we need to support Schmidt Island and everything that goes on there. And it really, I thought, uh, opened the eyes of so many of us there to the potential. And that I'm glad to see that he's actually here, seeing things through. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, Mr. Dixon also makes a very good case for uh, what's next here in Dubuque and uh, some exciting things that are not, that not just could happen, but will happen uh, with the leadership team and the inspiration that you've given us. So thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Yeah, and just real quick before I say anything else, quick thank yous to Alex for the presentation tonight, all the work that you're doing here. Um, I, we, it's visible. We have seen it. And Kathy, I, behind Alex over here, thank you so much to you as well. Um, Kevin, Mr. Lynch, for all the work that you did. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, David, about the um, 
about uh, when you mentioned this during goal setting. I'll never forget that because it really did. I'll, I'll admit it opened my eyes to the possibilities of what is on Schmidt Island. I was a little bit in Ms. Wethel's camp. I, I hadn't spent enough time there in my life. I had uh, I had not seen what the possibility really was until you get off and um, go back to the airport puns, the 30,000 foot view. <laughs> Um, everybody from ECI who helped on this as well, um, Kelly and Dan, everyone on the team, thank you so much for, for your help with this. All that said, um, you know, one of my favorite things about representing the, the people of Dubuque in, in an elected capacity in this way is when you get to go to other places and talk to people about Dubuque. And when you get people to talk to you about Dubuque, completely unsolicited. So just a quick example, um, you know, I spent some time last week with several people actually are sitting here um, on, on the desk with me with the, at the Iowa League of Cities Conference. It happened to be in Waterloo. Iowa League of Cities works to help uh, city governments to be able to represent our needs across the state, uh, both big and small. And um, this was we a well-attended conference. I mean, somewhere around 500 people, I'm gonna say. Pretty well attended. Uh, but I had so many people, every single meal I ate sitting at a table talking about, you know, they'd, they'd say, oh, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm, I'm mayor in Dubuque. And they say, I love Dubuque. That's the number one thing that I heard from everybody. I love it. Let me tell you all the reasons I love it. They talk about the mill work. They talk about the river. They talk about all those things. I love that. But I tell you what, it's easy when you're sitting in those moments to think to yourself, well, good, done. We did it. Dubuque is awesome. We're done here. But what I love about the discussion that we're having now is that we realize that that's not the case at all. There is so much more potential that we have here. And I think it fits directly with something that we just approved um, immediately before this, having to do with the airport and drawing, drawing people in, making sure that we have uh, the ability for people to get to Dubuque and the ability for us to connect everywhere. But this project and the ones that we're gonna be talking about on Schmidt Island in the year ahead are essential to who we want to become and who we really need to become. The difference between us right now and some other cities that are starting to catch up, and it's not all a competition, I'm not saying that, but uh, other cities that are, are doing something a little different is they're investing in themselves in this way. They're investing in the amenities that do keep people and retain people and attract people. We need to do that. It comes with a cost, and, and Mr. Resnick pointed out you know, what that cost can be. Uh, I think it's important that we do recognize that, but. It's the return on that investment that we need to think about. So I agree with Mr. Jones. I, I do think this is a no-brainer. I, I don't think it is for everybody, and I think that's a reason why we do need to have these conversations every time that we talk about this, because it's hard to invest in yourself sometimes. It's hard to do that. It's hard to say we need to do this in order to grow, to be better, to be the best we can possibly be. And we need to do it not just so we bring tourists in, but we need to do it for us. The backwater stage has always been one of my favorite places to go. I'm not gonna mention which band, but one of my favorite bands played there one time, and I got to go down and see them. And um, I rode my bike there. I rode my bike to it, to my concert for one of my favorite bands of all time. And one of the things I like about this particular investment is that we have evidence that it already is going to work because of the way the backwater stages work for this particular venue. We have evidence that tells us this is gonna be something that's going to be good for us. So all that said, thank you for all this work. Um, to, the, to the folks in the state of Iowa and the Iowa Economic Development Association, I really, or agency, I really do um, hope that they take this one very seriously as they look at this application, because we are a gateway to Iowa from the east. We really are. We've got two bridges coming in. I'd, I'd love to see them both lit up because that'd be great. I like that little visual right there. That's really nice. But I think, um, you know, over time, you know, we, we really do need to embrace our role as that gateway to the state of Iowa. And, and I like that this uh, is moving us in this direction. So thank you for your presentation this evening. Thank you. I think we've all had an opportunity to say our piece. So with that, the motion on the table here is um, to receive and file and approve the recommendation of the city manager. Uh, we have a motion by Mr. Jones and a second by Mr. Sprank. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank you. Action item number three yeah. is work session request update on housing choice voucher program. Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Jones. I move that city council uh, schedule a work session for Monday, November 7th at 5.30 p.m. for a presentation on housing choice vouchers. I'll second. Got a motion by Jones, second by Roussel. Hopefully that works for everyone. Enough that enough of us will be here. All right. 
Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number four is 16th edition of Art on the River video. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. Move to receive and file and view the video. Second by Farber. And a motion by Roussel and a second by Farber. Please roll the video. We see people of all ages, all different walks of life, lots of interesting people. I always like to come to see what new art they're bringing in. It's like a, a annual tradition. I've been coming here for, I think, the last four years prior to COVID. And so I was anxious to get here to see what's new. We come down here every year because I had a, had a sculpture in the second year of the Art on the River. Uh, Rio Corriente was the name of it. So we've followed this and since then every every year we come down and see what the new art is. There's always good pieces. Giving our community and our residents something that's different and something that's special in Dubuque, it makes it a place that draws people in and that want to be a part of this community. I think by the city also supporting an exhibition like this, the city is saying that we support creatives, we support artists, we support creative thinkers, and we want those people to be part of our community and to be at the table to lend their voice to how our community functions and how our community just moves itself forward. The busyness of it all, the river walk, the people being joyful and being, it just seemed like the progressive art and just being around people. I think it brings a lot of people here. It dresses up the river walk and uh, I think people probably come back here uh, year after year maybe just to see what the new art is. It's a kind of a unique thing. One of the other cool things about Art on the River is that it changes every single year. So people who follow Art on the River as an exhibit, they actually, we've run into people down here on the Riverwalk who say they come back and stop every single year because they want to see the new sculptures in person. So it gives people a reason to come back to Dubuque as well. It is very important for Dubuque to have this type of art appreciation, this public art, so that everybody who's visiting Dubuque can come in and they'd be able to, to enjoy not only the nature and this beautiful river walk, but also art while they're here. And so I think this is something that Dubuque should keep up. I don't like going into a brick building to see the art, and so I think it is nice to be able to be exposed to it out here in the open. So over the years, I've come to appreciate art more because it's open to the public and I don't have the brick walls around. One of the things I think that helps put Dubuque on the map, it just makes a beautiful setting to uh, display art because of the river and all of the greenery. I mean, it, it is nice. We are the bridge is the name of the piece. We have the bridge up there, bridge here, a bridge here. We brought the river into it, the chasm everything. It really fell together. I mean, I thought a lot about it. Once the idea came into my head, it was just build it. That's what it takes to form a bridge. You have to build on both sides of the chasm, bring it together, meet in the middle, and then both use the bridge. It's a mutual thing when you're both involved in it. You both have skin in the game to keep that bridge open and clear and, and use it. That channel right there was in my mind. And it's gonna move throughout the whole year. All the full moon phases, all the sun phases will affect that. And this is nothing more in my eyes than kind of a, a timepiece. It's a nice river walk and it'd be nice without the art. You can look at like Gail's piece here, for instance, but then out of the corner of your eye now, you, it, you see the uh, shot tower and then the brewery and then you start, you just, the art helps you focus in on things that you might not focus in on. Kind of a perfect example of everything we've been talking about tonight, isn't it? It really is. It's just, just beautiful. Just so well done. Thanks again, Jenny, for your work on that every single year. All right.
Uh, we have a motion and a second. So, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next are council member reports. <clears throat> yeah, Ms. Farber. So, I'm going to continue on this theme and talk about how there is power in flowers as a. Um, Wonderful, wonderful last few days that um, I was honored to attend the America in Bloom conference along with uh, Kristen Dietz and Jennifer Tigas representing our volunteer organization and also representing Marie Ware and the group um, from Parks and Leisure. And um, it was 150 people in attendance, uh, over 40 communities were represented uh, physically that night, and um, the whole idea behind this was that we initially started out with a CN grant from one of the railroads to donate funding for Comiskey Park, and as a result of that funding and that grant, we were given two judges uh, and two advisors, if you will, to come to Dubuque to give us some thoughts about how we could continue in our beautification efforts and our flowers and um, all the things that we do for sustainability and to keep our environment healthy. And um, in addition to having experts uh, speak to us about horticulture and arbors and um, all kinds of landscaping for the beautification of the cities, it was interesting um, that we're talking about dollars and cents tonight because they were talking about beautification efforts, whether it's flowers or hanging plants, created economic engines for cities and redevelopments of their main street. And that some of these communities indicated that, boy, their commercial spaces filled up 100% if they were blight, and how that the beautification um, of the <clears throat> environment surrounding a city is really eye candy. And just like uh, I think uh, Katie had said, the fact that there's this big sign that says Iowa, colorful, bright, and brilliant would bring your car over to say hello to the city. That's the kind of things that they were talking about and showing about. Um, and this was our first year attending, and it was an honor and a privilege uh, because Dubuque was awarded um, many, many awards and recognitions for being our first time. And one was uh, best in category for communities over 35,000, um, and that was um, total surprise because sometimes it takes years and years for communities even to be nominated for that. We were also best in categories for some of our garden selections, uh, and we were also... Um, received an environmental um, award as well for the sustainability and the environment that we do in the city amongst others. So we'll be talking uh, to thank Marie and her team uh, at our next city council meeting, but brings a smile, talks about everything that we've been talking about here in terms of amenities uh, to promote people to work, play, and stay in Dubuque. So it was just a lot of fun and very honored to be there. And I felt just like you said about the mayor's or the um, Iowa conference that it was kind of being a, an ambassador of goodwill for Dubuque. And we were just all uh, really pleased and people were really very excited to learn more about our city and very appreciative. Um, we were very appreciative of the opportunity to be there as well. So. Thank you. Well, that's wonderful. Thank Mr. you for Mayor, representing not, not us so sure, well. Not sure that Susan mentioned that she was nominated as the Community Champion Award. Yeah. Thank you. You did not mention that, Ms. Farber. I did not. Thank <laughs> you for mentioning it, Mike. Was it just a nomination? or I think <clears throat> it, was it was a nomination. There were um, just a few people that got nominated for this award. And again, going back to the fact that this was our first year uh, to meet with advisors, we were just overwhelmed because yeah. normally that just doesn't. Uh, seem to come to the top, if you will. And so we have really put Dubuque, I think, on the map for the America in Bloom. And I look forward to the Dubuque in Bloom uh, activity and promotion going forward here. Just really a lot of smiles. So thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. Mr. Resnick. Yes, and good luck to you. Uh, <laughs> we could vote for you. I just want to mention that on Saturday, um, some of us, and probably besides myself, went to the Latinx Festival, um, and that was uh, uh, supported by Loris College down at the Smokehouse. It was so vibrant and so exciting, some fantastic food, and just a lot of people having fun. Uh, great cultural community, and uh, they're reaching out to everybody in the city, really, to come and join them, uh, learn about uh, not only their culture, but to participate in it, and uh, uh, really benefit from it. So it was exciting, and uh, I'm sure ha happy that they had a beautiful day, and uh, I went home. Um, I wasn't hungry at the end, by the way. It was, it was just a fantastic day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Yeah, Ms. Roussel. 
Go right down the line. Thank you. Um, I <laughs> was excited to attend the Iowa League of Cities, and it was fun to be a Dubuqueer at the Iowa League of Cities. And um, but it was fun to talk with other city leaders about the challenges they face in housing and childcare, and just to talk about what other people are doing. And um, you really, I really learned a lot. It was a great opportunity. Um, on the 24th, I was happy to um, provide remarks at the Marshallese Cultural Day and see some of the great artwork and the food and the dancing and the singing, and it was really awesome. And um, speaking of uh, eye candy for our community, um, Dubuque Trees Forever planted 25 trees last weekend and have 30 more on tap for planting this weekend at Allison Henderson Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Self. Really filling up the end of the summer here, aren't we? Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Jones. Um, had the opportunity to get out to Northeast Iowa Community College for the ribbon cutting last week, um, where some very tired facilities are looking pretty fabulous now. Congratulations to Dr. Rydell and to Dr. Wee for making it happen. Dr. Rydell pointed out that uh, I get to stand here and take a bow. He said, no, I didn't do any of this. <laughs> and, but he then introduced Dr. Wee, who did quite a bit of it, and it was, uh, it was a very nice afternoon. Thank you for that. And I think Dr. Rydell is going to do some great things. He will like continue to do like great. great to have him in town, for sure. Yeah. Ms. Wethel. Um, I attended the Dubuque Museum of Art's annual uh, art gala, <clears throat> which raises money for their funding throughout the year. Um, our art museum provides programs for children, for veterans, for um, folks suffering with dementia and their caregivers. Our art museum does so much for our community and uh, there are incredibly generous people in our city that help to keep that going. And so it was a privilege, it was a fun night and we got to have it outdoors in Washington Park. Um, and it opened up into the space. It was really lovely. So I'd encourage anybody to go down. The museum always has such wonderful offerings. And um, yeah, that night my kids did the babysitting for the night, mm -hmm. actually. And they had a great program. Anybody could bring their kids. And they did art projects. And the only request I believe I had from Margie was no glitter and no paint. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a fun night for everybody. That's great. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Sprank. Um, this upcoming Saturday, I, I always volunteer at the Labor Harvest Food Giveaway, so if anybody feels like coming to help and always helps to help, make just makes the whole day go faster. And then, of course, there's also the Bluff Strokes Project, I believe, mm -hmm. at the Steeple Square, which all kinds of gorgeous artwork, and it's actually fairly economical artwork. Sometimes you go into a place and I can't afford $500, but there might be something for under $100, so... That's where I'll be probably sometime Saturday as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And all paintings of Dubuque, by the way. Yes, all stars. paintings yeah. of Dubuque, right. yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, the only thing I would add to all the wonderful things that we're, we're, we're very busy lately, I see. Um, I, I, I was invited once again by the U.S. Conference of Mayors to represent the city of Dubuque. Um, and this time it was, it, was, it was a little, you know, this is one of those moments where you're sort of like, why am I sitting with the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, and the mayor of Miami Beach, Florida? And it was to talk about FEMA, um, some specific funding through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And um, they asked the city of Dubuque to, to be a part of that discussion. Again, talking about how we've used funding creatively, specifically around the B branch. Um, it fascinates people throughout the country. And it's something that's really important that we get a chance to tell that story. Uh, because other people are learning from the, the example that we set here in uh, our own little corner of the world. So um, I was very, very uh, proud to be able to represent Dubuque in that way there. So. Um, We'll see what we have next time, huh? Let's, uh, maybe we need a, a break or something. I mean, it seems like we're working pretty hard. Okay, we have a closed session, so I'll take a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. I move that the council go into closed session in accordance with Chapter 21.5 of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending litigation and possible sale of real estate. <clears throat> second by Sprank. Okay, I got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Uh, for the record, the attorney of the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in closed session is city attorney Krenner Brumwell. Uh, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Sprank. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We are in closed session.